salvation. Planted by rivers of water, and he shall bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he do shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. Oh, no, no, no. Like the chaff when the wind blows, they soon go. For in the congregation of the righteous, ungodly and sinners shall not stand. For their ways, for their ways, for their ways, they soon perish. He shall be like a tree, holy nation, planted by rivers of water. And he shall bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he do shall prosper. Psalm 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Greetings, peace, and blessings. Shalom, shalom. To all the Hebrew camps, congregation, Knesset, the nations, the Nethanims, the beloved Hebrew community near and far and scattered abroad. I am Chief Priest Banyala, presiding over today's Shabbat class, joined today by my reader, uh, Priest Gabaria and Priest Rashim. We are in the midst of a series, a series today. Uh, this week, this feast of weeks, this winter feast of weeks, we're in the third week and it's titled Angels and Demons. Angels and demons. Why are we talking about angels and demons? Because we have been clearly addressing that the angels were dispatched to help us and the demons are antagonistic to us. And so it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to know where our power relies. The Heavenly Father is sending it. And a lot of time it is being encumbered by a lot of these negative forces. But before we actually get into the class today, I want to talk about the tights because in this winter feast of weeks, we talked about the butterfly effect. Whatever happens on the summer side of the year happens on the winter side of the year. And there's a biblical feast called the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruit or the Feast of Harvest. The exact same thing takes place on the winter side. And there are winter fruit that the Heavenly Father wants and requires us to give unto him. And what do we do with that fruit? We give sacrifices unto him in the seventh, the sixth covenant. And we do the same thing in the seventh covenant, but spiritual sacrifices. And so we have the tights brought together. We have the flour brought together by priests. Every bag that is produced, the priests that put their hands upon it. The ingredients in there are scrumptious, it's delicious, but it's really for the oblation. So order your tights. Also the wine. We are in the midst of producing our own wine. Here in the South, here in America, they have a more natural grape called the muscadine. And it is a wild grape, but when I say wild, it's just not so domesticated. And it produces delicious wine. Wine appropriate for the oblations. Not too strong, not too alcoholic, it's very fruity. And the priests have their hands in it. We didn't put our feet in it like they used to do back <laughs> in the day. We put our hands in it and sanitary, and it's absolutely delicious. And this week, actually, we'll be bottling the winter bottle. This is now the summer bottle bottles, and we have uh, various different types of fruit wines as well. But also, we're in that time of the year where it gets cold outside and your immune system began to recede. And so we often, you know, catch viruses. Certain viruses we can't mention because a couple of our videos have been taken down. Uh, because we've mentioned it in an unfavorable light. Mm -hmm. But everybody know the virus that's out there. And you need to strengthen your immune system so that you can fight all viruses. And so we have double onyx. Double onyx is filled with some natural ingredients that naturally help boost your immune system in this time of weakness. These are the things that we do for our own physical benefit. And for your spiritual benefit, we got the calendrical study guide. This is a study guide codifying, bringing together all of the biblical holidays in a thorough explanation on each and every one of them. We're in the season right now. <laughs> this is the season, or the reason for this season is treason. <laughs> Spiritual treason. <laughs> High treason against the Heavenly Father. And we're going to be talking about in Angels and Demons 
how these evil demons have descended down in the earth and deceived the entire world. You know, nobody ever put out a trap with something you can't stand. You know, they never put out there a tempting thing that just repulses you. They always give you that delicious rat cheese if you're a rat, something that rats like, peanut butter, something that you like. And so the adversary is not going to put something out here that is antithetical to your spiritual growth and make it feel like it's something bad. It's going to all be all jolly. It's going to be nice. It's going to be comfortable. It's going to lull you right to sleep. Mm. And you need to fight to be awake. You know, for a rat to resist that cheese or peanut butter, whatever they put, he need to be disciplined. But most importantly, he need to be knowledgeable. Who in the hell put some peanut butter out here? <laughs> I ain't never seen that in my life. <laughs> it's too easy. <laughs> Stuff all jarred up in glass. You need to know it's a trap. You need to be knowledgeable. Let me resist that because my life is at stake. We're going to go to an unknown book to most, but it is a thorough book, especially to theologians and people who are serious about their spiritual growth. It's the book of Enoch. And we was in it in the first and second um, Angels and Demons class. We're going to go into it in this third one as well. Again, Angels and Demons, the angel that we're going to be focusing on is Uriel. Uriel. And the demon that we're going to be focused on is Belial. Belial. All right, very, very important. We talked about Asmodeus. We talked about Mestima. And now we're talking about Belial. These are opposite to each other. This pantheon of righteous angels is countervailing this pantheon of demonic forces. And you could tell the demonic forces by the strength of the righteous. They want to be the opposite of Raphael, Michael L., Uriel. And so they are doing these things, and you are the prize. You are the prize. Those righteous angels would love to come down and redeem you. Those negative demonic forces would love to take you. You're the prize. They're all fighting for you. And so we need to do everything we can to make sure that we are found acceptable in the presence of the creator called Abba Yahweh, to some God. Let's start at the book of Enoch, 20th chapter, and we're going to pick it up. In the very first verse. And these are the names of the holy angels who watch. Uriel. Now let's pause right there for a second. This is a powerful term. Watch. This doesn't mean that they're just looking through a prism, and just checking you out. This was a biblical term. And this biblical term means more than just observing. Let's get it in Daniel, fourth chapter, in the 13th verse. Daniel, fourth chapter, 13th verse. I'll um, give a little background on this. Uh, the children of Israel went into captivity into the Babylonians because of recidivism upon King Manasseh and the following kings as well. And the Heavenly Father uh, completed his vow, his word that he put upon the children of Israel that he would separate that kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar came in and crushed the entire kingdom, took the children of Israel into captivity, and took the sagacious ones amongst us. The most wise is like Daniel and had him in his confederation with his magis and witches and all of that. But Daniel superseded them greatly. He had a dream, and he wanted to know the interpretation of that dream. We'll pick it up in the 13th verse. And I saw, Daniel, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, and I saw in a vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. So King Nebuchadnezzar talking to Daniel, saying unto him, I had a dream, and a mighty watcher, these same watchers that we just talked about, these seven watchers, actually came to Nebuchadnezzar, actually came unto him. They don't only come to us. They come unto all men. When I say us, I mean the chosen saints of the Most High. They rule over everything, all things. And as you'll see in, this, in these scriptures here, he's letting you know that the Most High reigneth in the kingdom of men, every kingdom, even this kingdom that's reigning today that the Heavenly Father have watchers ensuring that they stay afloat. Now, when their time is up, as the Persians or the Babylonians' time was up, and the Heavenly Father said to them, many, many to cal up arson, which was simply, your time is up. It's over. And you can't reign not another second. When it's over, it's over. Now, let's continue. The 14th verse. He cried aloud and said thus, 
Hew down the tree. So he goes on and talks about his dream. Time will not afford me. This is not the subject today. The subject right now is talking about there were watchers going inside your chamber of imagery, your visions in the night watch, your dreams, and communicating with you. A lot of us are ready to meet an angel in the flesh, in the physical. But more often than not, they speak with you in dreams and in visions. And so Nebuchadnezzar was visited in a dream. He knew his dream and where it was from. Drop down to the 17th verse. This matter is by the decree of the watchers. This matter came by the decree of Uriel, Raphael, Michael. These are the ones that came and communicated the dream about his demise. And he visited Daniel to give him the comprehension of that dream. Look, the Bible is very complicated. I know that they have taught us that it is like a fairy tale. It is like a Nick and, uh, 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 just Nickelodeon channel or something. You can watch it and have fun. And it's not that. This is very, very complicated. And we have to be studious. We have to apply ourselves if we want to achieve this great reward that the Heavenly Father has promised us. Let's finish that, priest. This is the matter by decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. All right, so you should do your own research upon Daniel's visit with Nebuchadnezzar. So we know now that these watchers are mentioned throughout the Bible. And we're now showing that pantheon, right, of righteous watchers, who they were. You could just read that and you can quickly just ride over it. We know who these seven watchers were, who they are, and how they still intercede on man's behalf to this day. We're going to leave there and go to another beautiful book. They call it pseudepigraphal. It's not pseudepigraphal. This is the actual venerated valid book of the Heavenly Father. It is called the second book of Adam and Eve. The second book of Adam and Eve. Going on further regarding these watchers. We're going to get the 11th chapter. And we're going to start at the very first verse. And if you'll hold Enoch 69, verse 1, priest could bar you. Okay. Go ahead and read that, priest machine. Second book of Adam and Eve. Chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> After the death of Adam and Eve, Seth severed his children and his children's children from Cain's children. Cain and his seed went down and dwelt westward below the place where he had killed his brother Abel. Sorry. Verse 2. But Seth and his children dwelt northwards upon the mountain of the cave of treasures in order to be near their father Adam. And Seth the elder, tall and good, with a fine soul, and of a strong mind, stood at the head of his people and tended them in innocence, penitence, and meekness, and did not allow one of them to go down to Cain's children. But because of their own purity, they were named children of Abba Yahweh. All right, so we see here after the death of Abel that the heavenly father replaced him with Seth. All right, so Cain killed Abel. The father blessed him with Seth, and Seth had this insatiable appetite for righteousness. And he severed his children from the children of Cain, and we broke down as we translated Genesis, Reshif, the first, second, third, fourth chapter, showing you that there was a mighty war, that the children of Cain went warred with the righteous children, and then began to sojourn with the Uthrets, the natural, primal, primordial people of the earth, and began to procreate. He had an insatiable appetite for procreating and all the evil that came with it. All right, so now it says here clearly that because of Seth purity and righteousness, read four. They were named the children of Abba Yahweh. We now have Seth children being named children of the Most High, Abba Yahweh. All right, what does that mean? Let's read. And they were with Abba instead of the host of angels who fell, for they continued in praises to this Abba. This is amazing. They were with the Heavenly Father instead are in the replacement of the angels that fell. 
If you went back to Angels and Demons, the first class, we talked about on the fifth day how we had Bohemoth, Leviathan, and the Satans created, or the dragon, Tanin, created. Adam was created on the sixth. They would not bow down, and the Heavenly Father removed them from the hierarchy and the higher levels. They are the ones that were removed, and they came down to this plane called Sheol. They came down to this heaven right here called Earth. All right, so now we have these angels, these sons of Seth, I should say, men that stood in replacement of the angels that fell. This is complicated because some people talk about the fallen watchers and they just conflate them all together. All right, we have fallen watchers that happened in the sixth day when Adam was created, and we have the sons of Adam that failed in that first millennium. Two different kinds, all right? These men became angelic. Let's talk about who these guys are. Enoch, 69th chapter. Enoch, 69, verse 1. And after this judgment, they shall terrify and make them to tremble because they have shown this to those who dwell on the earth. We're going to expedite this. I'm just going to name them. You can read in there and you can get the names of them. We talked about Zaquan, Jaquan, the eldest, Asbiel, Gadriel, uh, Gadar, Pinimul. Talked about Kazdija, Tabiat, and the seventh was Kazbiel. These were those evil pantheons that came together and fell as watchers. The Heavenly Father used the sons of Seth to replace them. Now you're getting an inkling of what's going to happen in the seventh millennium, what's going to happen in the last day. Paul spoke about the adoption of the children, the adoption. These children that behave godly in these last days are going to replace those watchers, the sons of Seth that fell. Mm. And they're going to become immortal. They're going to become those spiritual ones as they were in the beginning. Let's go back to the second book of Adam and Eve. And let's continue on. When they were adopted, right, and became the children of the Heavenly Father, replacing the watchers that fell, let's look at their mentality. Let's look at the way they carried themselves. Let's look at what they were into. And contrast your own ways to their ways. Let's read. The second book of Adam and Eve, chapter 11, and continuing in verse 4. For they continued in praises to Abba, and in singing psalms unto him in their cave, the cave of treasures. Verse 5. Then, Steph, then Seth stood before the body of his father Adam and of his mother Eve, and prayed night and day, and asked for mercy towards himself and his children, and that when they had some difficult dealing with the child, he would give him counsel. But Seth and his children did not like earthly work, but gave themselves to heavenly things, for they had no other thought than praises, doxologies, and psalms unto Abba Yahweh. So this is the absolute prize of becoming a saint of the Heavenly Father, living to praise, worship, and honor the Creator. It was said in Ecclesiastes, in, Ecclesiastes, in the Bible, what is the duty of man? The whole duty of man is to fear the Heavenly Father and keep his commandments. And this is the duties of angels as well, to fear the Heavenly Father and keep his commandments. This was the mindset of the children of Seth before the world began to morph into what it is today. And these other things that we engage in are pure distractions from having this mindset. To please Heavenly Father, praise him, and worship him. Why is it done that way? Because of the negative demonic forces that are pervasive in the world today. Let's continue. Verse 7. Therefore did they at all times hear the voices of angels praising and glorifying Abba from within the garden or when they were sent by Abba or on an errand or when they were going up to heaven. For Seth and his children, by reason of their own purity, heard and saw those angels. Then again, the garden was not far above them, but only some 15 spiritual cubits. Now, one spiritual cubit answers to three cubits of man, altogether 45 cubits. Seth and his children dwelt on the mountain below the garden. They sowed not, neither did they reap. They wrought no food for their body, not even wheat, but only offerings. They ate of the fruit and the trees well favored that grew on the mountain where they dwelt. So they ate what they sacrificed to the Heavenly Father. They ate in the morning watch. It was called breakfast. They ate in the noon watch. It was called lunch. 
and they ate in the evening watch. It was called dinner. If they didn't sacrifice it to the heavenly father, they didn't consume, nor did they eat. And the kingdom of heaven was right above them. It was visible at that time. Only during the time of Babel did the heavenly father make it invisible where you can't see it with the naked eye. But it's still there. There's still interactions going on. You'll find out even in this class today that there's twofold in everything. If there's white, there's black. If there's up, there's down. If there's a physical world, there's a spiritual world. Those who know about websites and all of that, you may have that front page, but then you got the back end that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you, it won't work unless the back end is together. And that's exactly what's happening in this dimension that we're in right now. There is a spiritual back end to it, and that's where all the angelic happening is going down. When the wind needs to blow, go to the backside and send the angels to blow it when seasons need to come. The angels are in the background making sure that everything transpires per the commandments of the creator. Let's continue on. Verse 11. Then Seth often fasted every 40 days, as did also his eldest children. For the family of Seth smelled the smell of the trees in the garden when the, bl when the wind blew that way. All right, so we're going to expedite this and move over to the 20th chapter. So we see here that the children of Seth were so godly and so righteous that the Heavenly Father adopted them. And I said before that Paul spoke about this same adoption is coming in the last days. We shall be adopted children of the Heavenly Father. We shall be watchers, the same watcher that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. Going on errands for the Heavenly Father, delivering messages here in the earth, like Uriel, Michael, and all the other holy watchers. This is the gift of righteousness, behaving oneself, comporting oneself in the covenant that the Heavenly Father has given us, even in sundry time. And in dark time, we have to overcome. We have to be victorious if we are to achieve that blessed status. We're going to move over to the 20th chapter and speak about the fall of these men. Now, we talked about their dispensation, right, or their, their mindset during their dispensation, that first millennium. They were righteous. That's all they wanted to do was praise the Heavenly Father. They didn't care about secular work. They were seriously monk mode, monk status, praising the Heavenly Father day and night. Now, what happened? The 20th chapter. Let's pick it up at the 15th verse. Second book of Adam and Eve. Priest Rashim got it. Uh, the 15th verse. Meanwhile, the children of Seth, who were on the holy mountain, prayed, prayed and praised Abba in the place of the host of angels who had fallen, wherefore Abba Yahweh had called them angels, because he rejoiced over them greatly. Now we see another title placed upon them. These carnal men were also called angels, immortal, divine. If they never would have failed, they still would have been here to this day. But we need to discuss how they failed, how they fell from their lofty, beautiful perch that the Most High placed them upon. For time's sake, let's jump down to the 25th verse. Verse 25. But when Jared heard this, of the hundred men, his very soul was moved, and his heart was grieved. He then arose with great fervor and stood in the midst of them and adjured them by the blood of Abel the just. Let no one of you go down from this holy and pure mountain in which our fathers have ordered us to dwell. But when Jared saw that they did not receive his words, he said, he said unto them, O oh my good and innocent and holy children, Know that when you once go down from this holy mountain, Abba Yahweh will not allow you to return again to it. He again adjured them, saying, I adjure by the death of our father Adam and by the blood of Abel, of Seth, of Enos, of Canaan, and of Mahalalel to hearken to me and not go down from this holy mountain. For the moment you leave it, you will be reft of life and of mercy, and you shall no longer be called the children of Abba Yahweh but the children of the devil. Now, you should know this story, those who are tenured here in the House of Wisdom. We go through this quite often. But for those who don't, the temptations of perdition, the world, is what drug them out of the covenant. And the same things happen to us today. The temptations and the delicacies of the world, the fashions and the trends of the world bring us out of our covenant. It makes us less likely to do what they were doing on top of the mountain, singing to the Heavenly Father, praising, studying, honoring, 
doing all the things, using your body as a living sacrifice unto the heavenly creator. But they'll have you on TikTok doing all kind of crazy dances. Yeah, what you doing? You, you walk through Walmart doing all kind of pranks in the ninth hour. It's like you began to lose that position, that disposition toward praising the heavenly father and all the other temptations that come. It is a fight, as I said, from the onset. Yeah, angels want to bring you into immortality so that they can have brethren like themselves. And you have these evil demons want to pull you into their confederation or pantheon so that they can have uh, companions with themselves. There is no gray ground. There's no middle ground. You may think you're neutral. There's no such thing as neutral. You're either going to be a child of the heavenly Abba or you're going to be a child of the devil. Which one are you going to choose? And if you don't know which one you are, I'll tell you who you are. You're a child of the devil. When you are a child of the Heavenly Father, you know it. All right? You proclaim it. You profess it. You allege the oath and covenants of your forefathers. Let's read on. Verse 28. But they would not hearken to his words. Enoch at the time was already grown up. All it- right. So those who know the story... You know what? We're going to move on. Those who don't study this chapter, very, very powerful chapter. We're going to move down to the 35th verse. We have a lot to cover in a very short span of time. Verse 35. Then Abba Yahweh sent his word to Jared, saying, These thy children, whom thou didst call my children, behold, they have transgressed my commandment and have gone down to abode of perdition and of sin. Send a messenger to those that are left that they may not go down and be lost. All right, so there was once angelic watchers, which we aspire to be, to be adopted from being mortal man to the immortal man. But that doesn't mean that you're saved forever. You still have to maintain your godly disposition. Now, the Heavenly Father sent the watcher to these watchers to tell them, don't go down that mountain, the left, those who were left. You're talking about Noah, Shemham, and Japheth. Maintain in righteousness. And so we have here that they went down to perdition. That term is going to come back up again, perdition, in a moment. Let us be aware of it. We're going to leave there and go back to Exodus, the 20th chapter, pick it up in the first verse again. Give me Exodus, the 20th chapter, and the first verse. And the Heavenly Father spake all these words, saying, I am the Heavenly Father which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. My bad. Book of Enoch, the 20th chapter, and the first verse. So here we're talking about those watchers. We're talking about those that, once again, that organization of righteous men, people, women, that nation that dwelled on top of that holy mountain. They was once adopted as the angelic federation part of the Elohim. Those mortal men became angelic. And as soon as they became angelic, because of recidivist backsliding, they became mortal again. So if they could leave mortality and become immortal, we can do the exact same thing. We can leave mortality. As a man think it, so is he. So if we start focusing on spiritual things, spirituality, we'll see ourselves ascend to that great high level. Let's read Book of Enoch 20, verse 1. And these are the names of the holy angels... Watch. So when you read Watcher in the 66 and throughout the other books, you know what it's talking about. Talking about those righteous seven angels that we have been talking about and Angels and Demons, part one and two and three. Let's read on. Uriel, one of the... Now, he's the subject of the day, Uriel. He is one of the holy angels. What is his position? Who is over the world and over Tartarus. Now we have him over the world and over Tartarus. Tartarus. Let's find out exactly what this is talking about. This is a Greek word. It is a Hebrew word that has been translated into Greek. And then once again, the Greeks have picked picked it up and and conflated it into their uh, mythology. Just because it has been used in their mythology doesn't mean that it's not true. All right? They are a young nation in terms of the nations reigning on the earth. And so surely, collectively, they would bring together the history of the prior nations and began to bring them into their fold. Let's get Second Peter, the second chapter, and we're going to pick it up in the fourth verse. For if Abba Yahweh spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now, you find this word hell here, 
And those who follow along in their lexicon, those who use the Strong's, you'll find it categorized under G5020, G5020. If we can have that chart brought up, Tartarus, or Tartaru, this is a word that they use for hell. It is synonymous with Sheol. It is synonymous with perdition. And as I said a little earlier, each one of these heavens have a front and a back end. A front and a back end. Not that one we need, Tartaru. It has a front and a back end. The front end is the world that he talked about today, that we can see each other. And then we have that back end called Tartaru. Sheol. All right? Sheol, the grave, hell, the flesh. All right? So let's go back to 2 Peter 2, 4. And if you'll hold Enoch, chapter 40. Let's read that again. For if Abba Yahweh spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. All right, so those are those angels on the sixth day that were remanded into Sheol, all right, which is the spiritual side of this physical world. They are spirits, evil spirits and demons, and they have absolutely no sensation until they can enter into the physical world. Anybody know how they enter into the physical world? Through mankind, absolutely. They enter into you to feel, to touch, to taste, to smell, to experience pleasure. And so they are hell-bent on entering into you so that they can actually leave that realm, that sentence that they have been placed in, and so that they can experience some form of joy All right, for the time of their cursedness. Let's read Peter, 2 Peter 2, 4 again. For if Abba Yahweh spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing it into flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned with them. So the Heavenly Father is talking about how he brought forth damage and pain and suffering upon physical man and upon demons, all right? Here we see the word again, Tartaru, or Tartarus being used within Scripture. All right, let's go back to where we were. Let's read the book of Enoch, the 40th chapter, and he also speaks about the same thing in Jude. We're not going to go there, but he speaks about those unruly demons that were sentenced for chains. They shall receive punishment from the Heavenly Father. All right, they are going to leave the back end or the back page of this world. And that's what we're fighting against right now. They have become invisible, which is biblical speech for they are in that realm on this plane, and we can't see with physical eyes, only our chamber of imagery. A spiritual man and woman comprehend what's being said. They know that it's more than just a physical realm. You know, it's like going back three, 400 years from now uh, in the past and telling somebody about, uh, ultraviolet light, or microwaves, or radio waves. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> inventing that doesn't make sense. Just because you can't see it with your physical eyes doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All right? A time probably will come where they'll be able to sense these things on the back page of this world. But for now, it is our soul, it is our spirit that's able to discern these things. We're going to the book of Enoch, the 40th chapter. Pick it up in the first verse. And after that, I saw thousands of thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the heavenly father of spirits. Now the four sides of the heavenly father of spirits, I saw four presents different from those that slept not. And I learned their names for the angels that went with me made uh, with me made known to me their names and showed me all the hitting things. And I heard the voice of those four presents that they uttered praise before the Heavenly Father of glory. The first voice blessed the Heavenly Father of spirits forever and ever. The second voice I heard blessing the elect ones and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of spirits. The third voice I heard pray and intercede for those that dwell on earth and supplicate in the name 
of the heavenly father of spirits. And I heard the fourth voice fending off the satans and forbidding them to come before the heavenly father of spirits to accuse them who dwell on earth. That's very powerful. We have that fourth voice or that fourth angel standing in the presence of the heavenly father as a mediator, as an attorney in the court of Abba Yahweh, advocating so that we don't get accused by Hasatan. We talk about this quite often here at the House of Wisdom, that the judicial system that you see today is a weak car uh, carbon copy of the spiritual one in heaven. You have the heavenly father as the judge of all. You have the Messiah, which is our attorney. You have Hasatans, which are our prosecutors. And they go throughout the world finding infractions. They find you violating laws, statutes, and commandments of the Heavenly Father, and they quickly bring you to the court. And if you don't come to court to defend yourself, or if you don't atone, you're quickly found guilty. And with that guilty verdict, they can enter into you and possess you. So it behooves each and every one of us, when we are going to be accused, you will be accused, we are there advocating. We are there sending a message to our attorney to the Godhead, to the pantheon of righteousness, that we have atoned for that. Have that charge dismissed. I was in the ninth hour this morning. That charge is dismissed. This is how you must take your daily bread because they are relentless with the accusations against us. All right, so the fourth verse or the fourth voice that he heard was there standing up on behalf of the saints. For time's sake, we're going to jump down. And we're going to go to the the fourth angel if you would ah, just read on the eighth verse after that i asked the angel of peace who went with me who showed me everything that is hidden who are who are these four presents which i have seen in those words i have heard and written down and he said to me the first is michael and the first is michael the merciful and long suffering the second who is over all the diseases and all the wounds of the children of men is Raphael. All right, so we talked about this in the earlier class. The first class, we talked about Raphael, the angel that makes sure that we are healed in our sickness, whether it's mental, whether it's physical. He is the one that if you behave correctly, do the things that are required of you, send that message to Abba Yahweh, and then returns with the healing. Let's read. And the third who is set over all the powers is Gabriel. Now, we talked about Gabriel last week. He is the one that's over paradise, the third heaven of Abba Yahweh, and again, making sure that our oblations and sacrifices on the golden altar are executed. Let's continue. And the fourth. This is the subject of the day. What is the fourth? Who is set over the repentance unto the hope of those who inherit eternal life is named Fenuel. This Fenuel, brother asked about it last week. Who is he? He seems different. He seems different. We haven't heard his name before, but actually we have. Again, if we can hold Genesis 32, 24, I can show you his name in the Hebrew. Those who are taking notes, utilizing the Strongs, it is H6440, H6440, and it is Paulin. We have used this before, Paulin which simply means face, all right? And so when you see Paul Neem El, it is the face of Elohim, or the face some would translate as God, but the Godhead. This is what this means. He is the face of it. All right, let's get it in so-called Genesis, Reishi 3224. We'll read it in the King, King James. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Beautiful, beautiful chapter translated in Reishith. Doesn't say wrestled right here. They use causatively. This, this word right here means a, a cloud. And so causatively, you know, when you get in a fight, supposedly dust comes up. It's not what it's talking about at all. all right, he was in the midst of a cloud. Many, many, many saints were in the midst of a cloud and spoke with the Elohim. But it's a whole other subject. Let's read on. Verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. Right, and this word here, again, you can see it in the Strong's H3409, 
Yerek, simply means body. And so it lets you know he was in the spirit. And then the angel came and touched him in the body. It's like when you're in an oblation or you're in a dream and somebody's shaking you in the flesh. And they wake you out of your dream. And so the angel actually touched his flesh to wake him up, get him out of here. Jacob was saying, I ain't getting up. I ain't leaving this oblation. I'm going to stay here until I get what I deserve. Angel was probably body slamming him and all of that. He's like, I ain't getting up. I'm staying right here. I require something. So he didn't let the flesh pull him out of the spirit. Let's read on. Verse 26. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. Now, this is key point two. Those who understand the spiritual order of things, the night watch was coming to an end. And the day watch, this term here literally means first watch in the Hebrew. The first watch was coming. And there's an angel over the first watch, and the Most High is not about you being a little late. All right? There's no CP time in, in, in heavenly places. All right? When it transitioned over, the angels there, as a matter of fact, the term is called vigilantly. And that word means to anticipate, come before. So they was in the 24th lot waiting on the first lot, anticipating the turn of time. And so we got Jacob holding that up for some reason. And the angel was like, look, let me go so I can get into this first lot. Let's read. Continuing in verse 26. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Verse 27. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And so we talked about this before Jacob's name was changed. Israel it is no more Jacob because he had already finished that task in life. He supplanted. He took that covenant. He has it now. Now his mission has changed. Israel, we got the L at the end again. We got the priest or the prince of the Most High, the priest of the Most High and man. That's what it means. So to be an Israelite, you are a prince of power or a priest of the Alahayim. If you're not a priesthood of the Alahayim, you're not Israel. Fine. You're something else, but you're definitely not Israel. And if you're talking about sacrifices done away with, we don't do all that priestly stuff, then you might as well call yourself a Jebusite or Hamite because they do normal stuff. All right, the cream of the crop, the top, the elite of the entire world is the priest of the heavenly father and men. All right, let's read on. Continuing in verse 28. Now we're talking about names now. He changed his name. Jacob got that new name. Jacob's curious. Who are you? You gave me a new name, Israel. Who are you? Read. For as a prince hast thou power with Abba Yahweh. And, and we covered before in Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel 44, that term prince means high priest. That's what it means. Let's read. And with men, and hast prevailed. Verse 29. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? He's saying, look, stop all the chit-chattering. I gave you what you need. <laughs> all right, the first lot is coming. What you talking about? <laughs> Let's read on. And he blessed him there, verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Why did he call him Peniel? Why did he call him this? Because he told him the name. You'll see it in the translation. He comes back and translates it. Let's read. For I have seen Abba Yahweh face to face. And if you look at the Hebrew, Panim. Pawnee, all right? I've seen Peniel. I've seen him there. I saw the aura of the Elohim. He blessed me. He increased me. And by that authority and that name, I change over to a priest of the Most High and men. Read that 30th verse again. Verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen Abba Yahweh face to face, and my life is preserved. And as right. he, we're going to go back now. Go ahead and finish that. Verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the, soul, the sun rose up upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. All right. So we're going to move over to the book of Enoch, and we're going to get the ninth chapter. And we're going to show you who exactly Penuel is. Right. Start the first verse. Enoch 9 and 1. Then Michael, Uriel. Now we have Uriel, who is Uriel. 
If we can pull up the chart, Strong's H222, we have Uriel, Uriel, coming from the root Or, 215. We have talked about this before. This is H215. This is called light, all right? Coming from the Urum. Uriel and Urum all are coming from the root word, light. Or again, the light of El, or the aura of the Elohim. If you have seen the aura of the Elohim, you have seen the face, the Pawnim of the Elohim. Penuel and Uriel are synonymous, all right? They're the same thing. Some people have, may have said, I've seen the aura, the light of the Elohim. Some people may have said, I've seen the presence or the face. Penuel or Uriel, all the exact same thing. All right, read that again, priest. If you'll give me second, four. second Ezra 4, verse 1. Then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel. Now, these are the four of the hierarchy of the seven. All right, so we now have the seven. Now he's saying that we have the four who are chieftain. These are the ones that you see carrying the most high around on his holy and glorious mercy seat, his Ark of the Covenant. You find one at each corner of it, which I'll be willing, if we have time, we'll talk about a little bit later. And so these are the top of the top, all right? Right there under Melchizedek, all right? So we see Or, we see Ur, Uriel or Urim, all of it is coming from that root word that's appertaining to aura or light. Now, this is the essence of that angel. Let's see how he transpired or interacted with uh, the saints here on earth. Let's go to 2 Ezra, Apocrypha, the fourth chapter, the first verse. And the angel that was sent unto me, whose name was Uriel, gave me an answer. So we now have this long interaction between Esdras and that archangel Uriel. He's began to tell him why things transpired the way they transpired in the past, why he is going through what he's going through in the present, and what is to quickly befall them in the future. Uriel, once again, coming to them that is over this world and over the back page of this world, letting him know the mechanics of what's happening here in Sheol, in Tartarus, within this realm that we dwell in right now. Let's read. Verse 2. And said... Thy heart hath gone too far in this world. He said, your heart is too far on the carnal side. You have to come back and look on the spiritual side. Ezra, I want to tell you about this. Let's read. And thinkest thou to comprehend the ways of the Most High? Let's slide over to 2 Ezra, the 10th chapter, and the 28th verse, as we began to rapidly go through this class. So much information to unravel. So much deep information to begin to inculcate deep within our chamber of imagery so that we can be better for it. Let's read. Second Ezra chapter 10 and verse 28. Where is Uriel the angel who came unto me at the first? For he hath caused me to fall into many trances. So we have Uriel causing him to fall into many visions and trances. All right, this is how they communicate with the saints in the trance, in your chamber of imagery. And I tell you what Solomon told us, that the Holy Spirit of wisdom shall not dwell in a body subject to sin. You will not have Uriel talking with you in your chamber of imagery if you got all types of debauchery in your chamber. They cannot stand that. You will never be conversing with the spiritual realm. Right. So Uriel spoke to Ezra because his mind was pure, and his mind was pure because he stayed on the oblations of Abba Yahweh. He knew that the reason for this season was treason, and so he had nothing to do with it. You can be in these little stores shopping for regular stuff, and you hear, mm -hmm. and you just, yeah, yeah. somebody's coming through your chamber of imagery with spray paint, tagging up the walls, throwing trash everywhere, and Uriel is like, I can't be there. Mm. Get that crap out of you. You have to go and oblate, and that's what they're there for. Asatan and that evil pantheon has that stuff all around you to destroy you. And so we have to meditate on righteousness like the saints did on top of that holy mountain in times of uh, years ago. Let's read. And my end is turned into corruption and my prayer to rebuke. All right, so he's talking about the current predicament in this world. And so now you're clearly seeing now he that is over this world and Sheol, Tartarus, the spiritual realm, 
is that angel Uriel. So we talked about Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel. And we talked about Asmodeus, and we talked about Mistema. Now we're going to talk about another countervailing demon to the righteous realm. Let's get it in another book called The Book of Adam and Eve. This is not the first nor the second book of Adam and Eve. This is just titled The Book of Adam. And I believe it's the third chapter. They uh, number them a little funny. It's a chapter called The Fall of Satan. Come on, start the first. The Fall of Satan. The devil began to cry with forced tears. And the devil told Adam, oh, Adam, all the greed and the anger and all the grief of my heart are directed against you because it was through you that I fell from my dwelling. We covered this in the first chapter, right? That Hasatan was ambivalent, filled with hatred toward Adam. And Adam didn't know where all the hatred was coming from. And Satan began to address why he had this animosity toward him and all of this acrimony pent up against him. Let's read. It was by you that I was alienated from my own throne. My wings were more numerous than those of the cherubims, and I concealed myself under them. Because of you, now my feet walk on the earth, which I would never have believed. Adam replied to the devil and told him, What is my fault by which I have done all that, all that to you? The devil replied to him and told him, You did nothing to me but it is because of you that I have fallen upon the earth. And every day when, uh, the very day when you were created, on that day I fell from before the face of Abu Yahweh. So we're talking about those first fallen watchers in the sixth age when Adam was created. They refused to bow down and worship the Heavenly Father through him. And the Heavenly Father cursed them, sending them down to Tartarus. This realm right here, the lowest of all the heavens, this is the first heaven. It really should be deemed the last of all of them because it is the weakest of them all. And there's a parallel system here. We have the physical world that we can see. And again, we have that spiritual realm, the invisible realm, as Paul and all the other apostles spoke about, that you cannot see. You have to have the spiritual perception to recognize it. And this is what the Heavenly Father is blessing us with. They run rampant in that realm. For time's sake, jump down to 15.1. These six classes of other angels. Check that out. So we now have him in six classes. We have those seven angels that we talked about. The evil ones plotting, strategizing, and scheming against all the saints. They are the top higher echelon of that wicked pantheon against us. Read on. These six classes of other angels heard that and my speech pleased them, and they did not bow down to you. Then Abba became angry with us and commanded us, uh, commanded us, them, and me to be cast down from our dwellings to the earth. As for you, he commanded you to dwell in paradise. When I had realized that I had fallen before you by your power, that I was in distress and you were in rest, then I aimed at hunting you so that I might alienate you from the paradise of delights just as I have been alienated because of you. When Adam heard that, he cried in a loud voice and said, Abba, my life is in your hands. Make this enemy distant from me who desires to lead me astray and seeks to destroy my, my race. And so Adam confessed and said, these beings are simply here to destroy mankind off the earth. They're not here to play with you. Mm. They're not here to deal with you. They're not here to grow and prosper with you. They are here to destroy you. Now he began to confess. He recognized. He see them. He see what they have done in the past and what they seek to do in the future. What did they do in the past? It is by him that Eve had been lost. It is by them that Eve fell. Now we talked about this in Rashid, the third chapter. And in the fourth chapter as well, how these enchanters, not serpents, enchanters, how these evil satans entered into the primal man and began to get them to go adverse to the rules of Abba Yahweh. said Eve went astray. We're going to move over to the book of Enoch real quick. Hold what you got. Mm -hmm. Book of Enoch, the Ethiopic version, chapter 69, verse 6. 
And the third was named Gadriel. Remember him in the Pantheon? Gadriel? What did he do? He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. He showed mankind how to kill each other. Mm. How to create swords, guns, and till this day, he's still talking about, look at this new weapon. Yeah. It is the human atomizer. What's that? You blow in it, and man just disintegrates. And primal men like, I want that. Yeah. How much does it cost? Just cause a couple of hell to Satan and the killing and pouring blood of these saints over here? I'll get you that tonight. And so as he taught death in the past, he is telling them how to mechanize, weaponize, and commodify death to this day. We find and we see all kind of stuff going on in the news. And you could take a political stance and say, oh, those, those Israelis are correct, or the Palestinians. These people are all dealing in death. Death is all around us. And they keep you flaccid by being estranged from it. People are dying, not just in Israel, but in your local neighborhood daily. There's people on fentanyl. There's people on drugs. There's people just murdering and breaking in. They don't even make the news. They don't make, it may be, you know, page 30 in your local newspaper. But... People are dying every day, and these evil forces are responsible for it. What did Gadriel do? Let's read on. And he led astray Eve. Ah, he is the one that led astray Eve. So we see in the book, The Fall, uh, the Fall of Adam, that he's talking about these evil ones that we had talked about before. He is the one that entered into the enchanters of the primal men and convinced Eve to take the sacrifice to Adam. And the story goes on from there. Let's go back to the book. Of Adam. Uh, 17 and 2. All right. 17.2. At that moment. Start at 1 again. 17.1 of the first verse. Point one. 17.1. 1. When Adam heard that, he cried in a loud voice and said, Abba, my life is in your hands. Make this enemy distant from me who desires to lead me astray and seek to destroy my race. It is by him that Eve has been lost. At that moment, Belair, or Belier, became invisible. Check that out. What did he become? Belier, just named the demon now, of that evil confederation, became invisible. First, he was visible. Now, the Heavenly Father put him on the back end of the website. Mm. All right, you don't see him on the front page no more. It doesn't mean he's not there. All right, but you click the little checkout thing. He's right there. Cha-ching, bringing it up to you. He is there. You must have the eyes to see the invisible, to actually see him. This is what makes it so arduous for the car carnal person. If they could see it, they could believe it. But if you have on your spiritual spectacles, you know that everything that's happening in this realm is happening because of something in the spiritual realm, in Tartarus, all right? So now you see one name, Belier, Belier. We're going to look this up again. Those who have your lexicon, it just actually, obviously get it in the Hebrew. For those who have the Strong's, it's going to be Strong's H1100. And obviously, this is connected with a lot of words because there's a lot connected with this. This is coming from a root word of Bailey or Bell. And you'll see it being used multiple times throughout Scripture. You'll see Belial. You'll see Baal. You'll see Belzebub. Or you may even see it in a name like Jezebel. All, right, all of these is going back to Baal or Balaam, going back to this demonic spirit that we see right now. And whole kingdoms like Babel are based upon this evil spirit. And this is why the Heavenly Father spoke about a final kingdom, Babel the Great. And so this Baal or Belier is going to be persistent here to the very end. So let's look up Belial, H1100. We can bring that one up, prompt that one. And it's also, for those taking copious notes, connected with H1168, Baal. We'll see it all through Scripture. And H1166, and all of them around that realm is variants of that word, right? It's all going back to Bel, Bailey, talking about this evil spirit. It's not just mentioning confusion. Yes, Babylon may mean confusion. It's because Bel have them confused. And this is what those evil spirits do. 
As we spoke about before, we are in the war of ignorance. It's better stated we are in the war of confusion. The more you are confused, the more sound they are. And the more sound that you are, the more focused you are, the more confused they are. So we need to know the essence of this term, Belal, Belzebub. You'll see that, Baal, and even in Babel. Let's go to 1 Samuel, the second chapter, in the 12th verse. So we see here that Adam has called him out by name. Let not Belial or Bel take me over. Let him not enter into me. Let him not subdue me. Let him not completely possess me. And we know, we have read in the book of Jubilees, that after the flood, that antediluvian period, transpired and that post-flood era came, and we began to see these evil spirits after they began to conjure up and reading the walls of the pyramids in what is now called Egypt, conjuring up these forces, that the righteous had to come and be blessed with a sin offering to get rid of these evil spirits. Baal was all in the mist. All right, let's read that, Samuels. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Most High. All right, so we now have the sons of Eli, the judge, and the beginning high priest of the Most High. All right, beginning of this order of, of, of righteousness, this judge, Eli, had his sons that supposed to have been in the priesthood, but it says they were sons of Belial. And so this evil spirit has crept up to the head, crept up to the top, and began to take them over. Let's read. Verse 13. Read 12 again. Verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Most so High. So this evil spirit, Belial or Bel, caused them not to know the Most High. And so now we see the focus and the end goal for these evil spirits mm -hmm. is to get you, pull you away from the knowledge of Abba Yahweh, keeping you confused, keeping you ignorant. And so they're there with all manner of the opposite of righteousness. They have you going down the street singing jingle bells, out of your mind completely thinking that you're worshiping Abba Yahweh but you'll be like the sons of Eli, preferring something other than that which is right. It is a serious stratagem placed against us, and you must be wise, you must be sagacious, you must have that fortitude and that mindset that I will get truth or I will die trying. I will not be a son of the devil or a child of the adversary. Let's read. Yeah, if I could say one uh, real quick. Sports is also uh, a big misnomer or... Uh, a plan of deceit to draw you away from the Heavenly Father. How, how so, priest? We see how these people love sports. They can break down the stats of Michael Jordan from the time he was in high school till the time he was playing baseball, but can't answer one question about the Heavenly Father. These evil spirits don't want you to come into this knowledge. So that's, all a, that's, this a, that's a bold statement to make and to back it up. That's all one have to do is read the book of Maccabees. Mm -hmm. all right, this is when they first started coming out with gymnasiums and the javelins and all of that. And these Israelites, who was once of the Kohanim, the priesthood, began to relinquish their priesthood and say, yeah, I want to throw that javelin further than he did. I know I can beat him. And that word gymnasium means butt-naked place of exercise. And so they was just that, butt-naked, doing squats, all in front of you, <laughs> competing with each other. And this is what they preferred over the work of Abba Yahweh. And you can see it's still going on today. Yeah, right. And this is why they can pay a man. I think I was watching the TV and the news came on and some baseball players getting $300 million mm -hmm. to hit a ball out the park. Hit a ball out the park, you're getting $300 million. I don't know if that's a year. I don't know what it was. Pure madness. They pay him $300 million because he's doing a job. He's keeping your mind preoccupied yeah. on the frivolous things of the world. All of these athletes are here to distract you. They don't know it. They're pawns. Yeah. They just think that, you know, that's how it's supposed to be. But you have to be wiser than that. There's nothing you're supposed to have distracting you from this work. It don't have to be athleticism. It could be drugs. It could be your addiction to alcohol. It could be your perversions. It could be anything. It could be, it could be Christmas. 
And I know some of you right now are teetering on the edge. Should I go over there with them? Or should I stay to myself? You just got a text. That turkey is looking good. <laughs> that honey-baked ham has been soaked in Coca-Cola for two days. Mm. <laughs> and you are tempted. Should I go? I'm just going to go over and just to see the cousins, you yeah, know? Right. All of these things are distractions. As you saw earlier, the sons of Adam, the sons of Seth, they all was on the holy mountain praising the heavenly father. And they repudiated those, word, those works of the devil at the base of the mountain. It was repugnant to him. You know, if somebody is doing something less than, I'm going to tell you this, it's all wicked, but it's less than. It's wicked. Remember, I said that. I pretext this. All of this is wicked. But what's worse than pedophilia is idolatry. Mm -hmm. So let's say they was throwing a pedophilia party. Would you go over there to see the cousins? Yeah, absolutely not. Hey, no. I mean, <laughs> absolutely not. And so let's look at it something worse than pedophilia. You think you can just go and fraternize around them. It is, once again, repulsive to any spiritual person. So let's go back to the sons of Belial. They were of the high priesthood. And they began to be perverted by this evil spirit that is still prevalent to stay. Let's read. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 13. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was, was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it upon the pan or the kettle or cauldron or pot all that the flesh hook brought up the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. All right, so that was a righteous order that when people came and brought their lamb, ram, turtle dove, that the priest porter would take a three-pronged hook, take it, and the priest would look at it and take off his right shoulder, the best part of it, and then send it to be cooked. All right, that was the custom. Let's read. Verse 15. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to the roast for the priest, for he will not have sought in flesh of thee, but raw. Now, this is what it became by these sons of Belial. Let's read. Mm. Verse 16. And if any man said unto him, Let not fail to burn the fat presently. So before the priest actually ate of it, he would burn the organs. The fat is talking about the organs. Who do you burn the organs to? Anybody know? Abba Yahweh, absolutely. It's forbidden for you to eat tongue, liver, chitlins, heart, whatever that is, all right? Any of that stuff is an abomination to eat. It was all sacrifice unto the Heavenly Father. And so the Heavenly Father said, don't you eat of your portion of the sacrifice until you burnt him his, mm. all right? And so you would give that to the Heavenly Father and patiently wait when it was done, and you would take your right shoulder or the best part of it, whatever you required, the brisket of it, the flesh part of it, and then you will begin to consume yours. But the sons of Belial thought this was too arduous for them. Let's read that again, actually. Verse 16. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, nay, but thou shalt give it me now. And if not, I will take it by force. He said, give me that raw meat. If you don't give it to me now, I will bust you in the head and take it. I will mm -hmm. physically lay hands on you and get this meat, porter. <laughs> and so they start trumping him, getting the raw meat. Adverse to what the Heavenly Father was saying, because he literally said, cook this food. Get the blood out of it. Yeah. And so the sons of Belial were like, we like it raw. Mm. We like it rare. Mm. That's what they say today, rare. Like a little blood dripping right out of it. It's so scrumptious. <laughs> but this is the spirit of Belial. Why? Because remember, they're dealing in Tartarus. They're on that, that, that invisible side where they don't get to taste, touch, smell, feel anything. So when they come over here, they like to go extreme with it. Extreme. They want all the flavor. And so they do this. They love the blood thereof, and it is the life of the animal. And those without life like to eat the life of the animal. The Most High said, cook it. We are the children of life. You need not that. All right, let's read on. Verse 17. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Most High. So the sons of Belial kept adding sin to sin 
by eating this raw meat and doing detestable, debaucherous things in the temple. This was the priesthood. Let's read. For men abhorred the offering of the Most High. Men hated the offering of the Heavenly Father because of these rogue, renegade priests. But what was Samuel doing during this time? Verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Most High, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Just like the sons and daughters of Seth on that holy mountain. They loved nothing but doxologies, praising the Most High, psalms, and singing unto him. Even though he was not of that high priest, Kohanim, he was behaving like one. And the Most High often switched it and began to give it over to him who was more worthy of it. All right, we now see Belier in Scripture, Bel, this evil spirit being pervasive even in the priesthood. And it grows when you hate the offerings of Abba Yahweh. And so look at and check out the minds of those that say sacrifices are done away with. Who has them? Belier have them. Bel have them. Anybody that is adverse to it, always coming with something contrary to it, anybody talking about well, you need to submerge yourself in full baptism one time, you have the spirit of Belial on you, mm-hmm. spirit of the devil. First of all, they don't want you doing it. And if you are doing it, they want you doing it incorrectly. Mm-hmm. All right, so they're going to be on one side of it. Don't do it. And if you persist on do it, well, hey, how about doing it this way? Yeah. Get some yeasty bread and get this pork, pork fired wine. And let's do this, and let's, so we have to be like Samuel. Have nothing but a mindset to praise Abba. Whatever his will is, is our will. We're going to pause right there and go to the book of Jubilees, the first chapter in the very first verse. So we're talking about angels and demons, and we're talking about these righteous angels, Uriel, Uriel, this angel that is the face and the aura of Abba Yahweh. And we're talking about his countervailing opposite, his arch nemesis, Belial, Belial, Beelzebub, all of these names that got that bell in it is all coming from Bailey or Baal, which is that demonic force that is always against the covenant of our father. And so we're dealing with this realm we're on right now, that spiritual realm and the world. And so they're doing everything out of that invisible realm to keep you operating in dysfunction in this world. It's a battle, people. Nothing that we get comes easy. And so you need to apply your mind, your heart, your soul, and have that dedication to overcome and be victorious in this walk. The book of Jubilees, 1 verse 1. And it came to pass in the first year of the exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt, in the third month on the 16th day of the month, that Abba Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Come up to me on the mountain, I will give thee two tables of stone of the law and of the commandments, which I have written that thou mayest teach them. And Moses went up to the mount of Abba Yahweh, the glory of the heavenly Father, blow abode on Mount Sinai. And a cloud overshadowed it six days. And he called to Moses on the seventh day out of the midst of the cloud, and appeared of the glory of the Heavenly Father, or the appearance of the glory of the Heavenly Father was like a flame of fire on the top of the mountain. So now we have the Heavenly Father visiting Moses, getting ready to bestow upon the children of Israel the sixth covenant. And those of you who are red, obviously you have a a stronger standing than those who are not, but we're going to try to move on anyway. Let's move over to the seventh verse. And do thou write for thyself all these words which I declare unto, uh, which I declare unto thee this day, for I know their rebellion and their stiff neck, before I bring them into the land of which I swear unto their fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying, Unto your seed will I give a land flowing with milk and honey. So he said, I know the disposition of these people that I'm dealing with. A liar will enter into them. Asmodeus, Mestima is fighting again to get them, and they're giving themselves. They're not being steadfast or resistant to these evil forces. They're yielding their members over to evil. And we can't be like our predecessors, our forefathers. We need to know that they took the easy route. What was given unto us is the hard route. The Messiah said, take this bread and offer up your daily oblations. You give your daily sacrifice. You're daily. You must fight every day. You cannot take a vacation. 
This is the battle that we was all selected to fight. Let's read on. The eighth verse. They will eat and be satisfied, and they will turn to strange deities. The Heavenly Father said, as soon as I give them a blessed situation and predicament, they're going to ease on the work toward the Most High and turn to the deities of these strangers around them, which are no gods at all. Read on. To which cannot deliver them from aught of their tribulation. This witness shall be heard for a witness against them, for they will forget all my commandments, even all that I commanded them, and they will walk after the Gentiles and after their uncleanness and after their shame, and I will and will serve other deities, and these will prove unto them an offense and tribulation and affliction and a snare. All right, so these deities are all put forth by that pantheon of evil to put us in a trap to separate us from the Heavenly Father. It is a stratagem put forth, and we must apply ourselves wholeheartedly to comprehend the ways of the Heavenly Father so, again, we can be victorious. Let's read. And many will perish, and they will be taken captive, and will fall into the hands of the enemies because they have forsaken my ordinances and my commandments and festivals of my covenant. And we see this happening today. We have forsaken the covenant of the Heavenly Father and his festivals. And when we return, as I said before, they say, don't do the sacrifices. But if you insist, do this. They give it for you. They give it to you, for you. They say, here are the seven high holy days when there are ten. They strategically hold back so that you will never be complete. Yeah. They know you love it easy. You like for them to package it for you and give it to you and spoon feed you. They know that the heft of the work, the intellectual work, you're not going to do. They know it. And so they give it to you. And so the Heavenly Father is telling you, be aware of Belial, Belier, Beelzebub, Bel. They're all there to destroy you. Read on. Because they have forsaken my ordinances and my commandments and my festivals of my covenant, my Shabbats and my holy place, which I have hollowed for myself in their midst, and my tabernacles and my sanctuary, which I have hollowed for myself in the midst of the land, that I should set my name upon it and that it should dwell there. And they will make to themselves high places. Now pay close attention to this. Now the Heavenly Father is saying, I have given you all of these right things, good things. I've given you the Feast of Weeks, Tabernacles. I've given you Shabbat. I have given you new months. I've given you all those good things and a temple where he placed his name for you to come and offer the sacrifices. And Israel, being recidivist, decided to go astray, not because of their own volition, but because Asatan, the evil Belial, was whispering in their ear all types of great fanatical things that he can never deliver. But we, once again, Giving in, yielding to those lies as we give in and yield to lies to this day. What happened when they gave in to the lies? They will make them to, uh, and they will make to themselves high places and groves and graven images. Let's pay close attention to this because it's going to come back over and over and over. Anybody know what a grove is? Like an orchard, orange grove? Yeah, trees, a bunch of trees. Why did the most I say this is something negative? And we're going to show you in the law, he says, next to the temple, don't you ever place a grove there. These were all trees like totem poles, not only totem poles, but trees you'll begin to see that they began to decorate and name after their gods. We'll get into it in a moment. Mm. But the Heavenly Father is telling you, keep those groves of trees away from the temple. And they're going to go do it anyway, though, because the Gentiles and Belial told them to do it. Let's read. They will make themselves high places and groves and graven images. And they will worship each his own graven image. So as to go astray, and they will sacrifice their children to demons and to all the works of the era of their hearts. So we see now that it's all for the end game. You to sacrifice, give an offering to these demons unwittingly. You're not even knowing it. You're going to see that they're actually thinking that they're doing something great and good, something beneficial to them. This is the great ruse, the great stratagem, the great deception that is placed upon all mankind. For time's sake, priest, jump down to the 14th verse. 
And after this, they will turn to me from amongst the Gentiles with all their heart and with their and with all their soul and with all their strength, and I will gather them from among all the Gentiles, and they will seek me so that I shall be found of them. So the Heavenly Father is saying, I understand these people, but in the latter days, they are going to repent, they are going to convert, they're going to change from all their evil ways. How? Because the Most High will give us a seventh and final covenant, and they're going to be a remnant that is going to hold dear to it, knowing our recidivist ways of the past, and never repeating that. Let's read on. So that I will be found of them when they seek me with all their heart and with all their soul. And I will disclose to them abounding peace with righteousness and will remove them the plant of unrighteousness with all my heart and with all my soul. And they shall be for a blessing and not for a curse. And they shall be the head and not the tail. So the Heavenly Father is saying they shall have abounding peace. That means never-ending peace. And the only way to have never-ending, abounding peace is to have that verbal, audible, spiritual peace offering oblations going up any and every time accessible to everybody. This is what the Heavenly Father is giving us. He's intimating he's going to give us a final covenant where the peace offering shall be prolific. Let's read on. The 16th verse, and I will build my sanctuary in their midst. And, and I will build my sanctuary, that third heaven, in them. Their hearts shall be circumcised. Once again, letting you know that we are in those days, not because of time, but because of what is actually transpiring here in this world. The Most High has given us the peace, and he's built that temple within us. and We're offering those oblations within. We're getting the victory over Belial right now in the Feast of the Most High. Let's read. And I will dwell with them, and I will be their Abba, and they shall be my people in truth and righteousness. And I will not forsake them nor fail them, for I am Abba Yahweh, their power. And Moses fell on his face and prayed, O Abba Yahweh, do not forsake thy people and thy inheritance, so that they should not wander in error of their hearts, and do not deliver them in the hands of their enemies, the Gentiles, Least they should rule over them and cause them to sin against thee. Let thy mercy, O Abba Yahweh, be lifted up upon thy people and create in them an upright spirit. So Moses prayed and said, Do not let them wander in the error of their mind, a.k.a. the heart. Do not let Belial dwell within their spirit. He's praying that our spirit is able to maintain strength. Moses is praying for us in his day that our chamber of imagery stay clean and that we are able to execute upon Belial the wrath of the Most High Abba Yahweh. Let's finish that up, priest. And let that the spirit of Belial rule over them. That's what he mean when he says the Gentiles rule over. All right, he's talking about Belial has entered into you, caused you to go adverse to the will of the Most High, trespassing, accusing you in the court of the Most High, getting that sentence upon you and dwelling in you, ruling over you, being able to sensualize, touch, feel, taste, smell, do whatever he wants to do. And you, like a used automobile, when he crashes you, he go get a new one. He jumps right off of you and jump right into a new one. You don't kill him by killing your own brother. He could be on your brother, and your brother could have done all manner of things to you and your family, and you go take vengeance, put a bullet in that man's head. You go to jail, and Belial moves on to another person. Yeah, son. You execute him by spiritual offerings, sin offerings. Let's read on, priest. And let not the spirit of Belial rule over them to cause, uh, to cause them before thee, to accuse them before thee. There it is. Belial is accusing brothers and sisters. He is bringing accusations against you in court. You must become cognizant of this. When you do wrong, it is being witnessed. It is being observed. You get away with nothing. Stop trying to sneak and get away. Yeah, you may get away from and uh, lie to your brother, lie to your husband, lie to your wife. Yeah, you may have gotten away with it in the flesh. But in the spirit, you're being accused in the court of the Most High. And the best thing you can do is confess in the court of the Most High and atone through the bread and the wine. And your sins and trespasses can and will be forgiven. But they're counting on you to be ashamed. They're counting on you to be confused and ignorant. 
so that they can again enter into you and possess you. Read on, priest. And to uh, ensnare them from all the paths of righteousness so that they may perish from before thy face. But they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou delivered with thy great power from the hands of the Egyptians. Create in them a clean heart and a holy spirit, and let them not be ensnared in their sins from henceforth until eternity. And the Heavenly Father said unto Moses, I know their contrariness and their thoughts and their stiff neckedness, and they will not be obedient till they confess their own sins and the sins of their fathers. And after this, they will turn to me in all right and in all uprightness and with all their heart and with all their soul. And I will circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed. And I will create in them a Holy Spirit and I will cleanse them so that they shall not turn away from me from that day till eternity. That is the good news. Heavenly Father had talked about our wayward ways and, uh, ways and actions that we entered into in times past, but he also predict and forecast that we will circumcise our heart. Circumcise is a mark of the covenant. When a man circumcises himself, he leaves within his body a mark that I am in covenant with the Heavenly Father. So what does it mean to circumcise your heart? Is to have a covenant in your chamber of imagery, a spiritual agreement, a contract with the Most High. It means that your meat offerings must become spiritual. Your words are spiritual. If you speak them, the Heavenly Father said, I will respect and honor them. Give me the cast of your lip. Give me the drink offering of your mouth. Take that drink offering and offer it unto the Heavenly Father. Now, this is a spiritual sacrifice that nobody can take from you. The only person that takes it from you if, if they confuse you. You're not in your right state of mind. That's Belier. That's Mestima. That's Asmodeus, having you doubting the works of the Most High. But if you are primed and you're on point and you're sharp, you offer up sin offerings and trespass offering and peace and thanksgiving offering daily. This is getting the victory over the evil ones. This is getting victory over Tartarus and the world. This is how we do it. The Heavenly Father is prophesying what we're living in this day. Time sake, priest. And Moses spoke the same thing about circumcising your heart, being in covenant in mind with the Heavenly Father. And once you do this, it will begin to change your trajectory. As a man thinketh, so is he. As you begin to remove these demonic forces in power, you begin to see that the inclination that they bring forth begin to diminish. You begin to see the limits that they have placed there for you begin to assuage and go away. You begin to see the iron, a glass ceiling that they put up there for you begin to be broken. In righteousness, meaning the righteousness that you want to achieve it is now achievable. I'm not saying you can go out and be that athlete that you wanted to be. I'm talking about if you wanted to worship the most high, it becomes limitless. If you wanted understanding or revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, or Enoch, if you wanted to go to the second, third, fourth, seventh heaven, you began to see it in visions and dreams. If you require to see Uriel, Raphael, Michael, you began to see it when you never saw it before. These are the limitations that a righteous man or woman loves. But the carnal could not care less. All right? They want to be that athlete. They want to be that mogul. They want to be that musician. They want to be that, that, that model. And this is not going to help you there. If you're looking for that, you're in the wrong place. You need to go call up Puffy and go to his little parties he got going on that I've been hearing about lately. All right, but this is where you get closer to the most high. All right, priest, we're going to jump down from there. We're going to move over quickly. Another misunderstood and unknown book called The Martyrdom of Isaiah. They have conflated this together and called it The Ascension of Isaiah. The Ascension of Isaiah, you don't want that one. You want the Ethiopic version called The Martyrdom of Isaiah. The Ascension of Isaiah is the Greek and the Slavic and all of these weird third century Christians throwing all kind of Christianity on top of a holy book. And I thank the Heavenly Father for the Ethiopic version. These were people that were set apart. They were Hebrew, going into the interiors of Africa, preserving the books that they had. And so we now see with the Greeks or the Slavics, 
or these Eastern Europeans in these Orthodox churches, they had no limitations. They saw something that they didn't understand. They had absolutely no problem with pulling out their pens and start scribbling in there and saying, this is what it meant. Spirit showed me that. Spirit showed me that's what it meant. And then 100 years later, oh, that's authentic. It's not. Once again, this is the book called The Martyrdom of Isaiah. We're going to be jumping through this once again. We're already in the second hour. We've got a lot to pull out. But we're talking about Belier, how he engaged, how he interacted with the saints of old, and his very little difference today. This has given us some clarity of what's happening here. We're going to start at the first chapter, if you will pick it up, priest, in the seventh verse. And whilst he, Hezekiah, gave commands, Josab, the son of Isaiah, standing by, Isaiah said to Hezekiah the king, but not in the presence of Manasseh, only did he say unto him, As the Most High liveth, whose name has not been sent into this world, and as the Spirit which speaketh in me liveth, all these commands and these words shall be made of none effect by Manasseh, the son, thy son. All right, so we have now King Hezekiah who had a son named Manasseh. Hezekiah was one of the righteous of the king. So it doesn't let, it lets you know, though, this is not about biology or DNA. It's all about the mind. Uh, Hezekiah was righteous, but as righteous as Hezekiah was, Manasseh was a twofold child of the devil. Uh, it worse than any righteousness that his father did. And so we have Isaiah telling us more than what you may see in the book of Isaiah. The angel told him that his son Manasseh will saw you in half uh, and kill you. Be prepared for it. And so he didn't run from the prophecy that was given that was not advantageous to his flesh, but advantageous to his spirit. He just embraced it and told Hezekiah. And as you'll see, Hezekiah was like, that boy gonna try to kill you? Let me pull my belt out and beat some sense into him. Isaiah was like, nah, leave him alone. If the father says it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Just embrace it. But let's read on. Seeing what made Manasseh get so wicked. And continuing in verse 7, and these words shall be made of none effect by Manasseh, thy son. And through the agency of his hands, I shall depart mid the torture of my body. And Samael, Malchira, shall serve Manasseh and execute all his desire. And he shall become a follower of Belial rather than of me. Ah, we have him, the king shall become a follower of Belial, of Bel, of that evil force that beguiled Eve. He's still in our people. He is still in their chamber of imagery, beguiling them, tricking them, fooling them into all manner of things that tear us apart from the Most High. Let's read. And many in Jerusalem and in Judea shall cause to abandon the true faith and Belial shall dwell in Manasseh. Herein lies his purpose again, to get you to abandon the truth. To get you to walk away from what is right and what is good. And he does this by offering an alternative. He never comes with truth, real truth, to fight truth. He fights truth with lies. You'll begin to see the lies that he began to tell Hezekiah. Let's read on. Continuing in verse 9. And Belial shall dwell in Manasseh, and by his hands I shall be sawn asunder. And when Hezekiah heard these words, he wept very bitterly and rent his garments, and placed earth upon his head and fell on his face. And Isaiah said unto him, The counsel of Samael against Manasseh is consummated, not shall avail thee. All right, he said, This is already happening. The most I spoke it, it will be done. Once again, for time's sake, let's go to the second chapter. We'll pick it up in the fourth verse. Before the face of Hezekiah, the words of wisdom, and from the service of Abba, and Manasseh turned aside his heart to serve Belial, for the angel of lawlessness, who is the ruler of this world. He called him the angel of lawlessness. Now, we talk about law here quite often in the house of wisdom. Anybody tell me what law means in the Hebrew? Talk about laws, we talk about statutes, we talk about commandments. Torah, right? The Torah means sacrifice. Doesn't mean the first five books of Moses, this is what the Khazars taught you. It means sacrifice. 
And so lawlessness is talking about without sacrifice. And so he came adverse to the sacrifices. Why? Because a sin offering is what exterminates him. It is our most powerful weapon against him. Of course he will come against Torah. He will come against it. He came against it. And we see what the sons of Eli were doing. They abhorred the sacrifices. Lawlessness reigned and prevailed in Israel. Let's read, priest. Continuing in verse 4. For the angel of lawlessness, who is the ruler of this world? He is the ruler of Tartarus. He is the ruler of this world, this realm that we live in today. This is who we are fighting against. Not just one, though. We're talking about legions, a confederation of them. He has this incalculable multitude of sin. It all works with them. And so they're over this heaven, this realm. They come into the invisible, and they come in the visible through you, letting you know that they shall take over the children, and this shall be their characteristics. Let's read. Who is the ruler of this world is Belier, whose name is Metambucus, and he delighted in Jerusalem because Manasseh, and he made him strong. And in we're going to be talking about Mantabacus later on, not in this one. You can take your whole class on this one. But make sure you highlight that. We're going to come back to that. Very, very powerful. But what does he do? And he made him strong at, a, at apostatizing Israel in the lawlessness which was He made spread. Israel apostate, rejects, rejects of the heavenly father. And so look at what's going on. You have righteousness against evil and evil against righteousness, dark against light and light against darkness. There is a war already on the battlefield. And if you're not aware of this war that has been transpiring since the days of Adam, it's because you're dead on the battlefield. You are a victim of this war. It's time to resuscitate and fight. These are the evil spirits that we battle against daily. Read on, priest. And he made him strong in making Israel apostate in the lawlessness which was spread abroad in Jerusalem and witchcraft, and magic increased, and divination, and augulation, and fornication. Look at what he says, auguring. Mm. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of it, inauguration? Mm. Ah. All right, when you speak about these politics that you engage in, it's all part of witchcraft. Right. I know you want the Democratic Party to win. You're just casting your vote. You're just casting your vote. You engage in augury. These people have forms of witchery and witchcraft to put forth who they shall choose, all right? It used to be that they let the birds loose, and if they flew east, that meant something. West, that meant something. North, that meant something. But they got all types of ways of engaging in this. So all you have to do is look it up. You have to look up Capitol Hill, what the Greeks and the Romans used to do. All of these politics are predicated on something dealing with Tartarus, the dark realm, the invisible realm. You think your vote counts? They have something deeper involved, all right? It is a haven of every evil spirit, all right? They're doing nothing to promote righteousness. As a matter of fact, they are anti-righteous, all right? Look at any and evil thing that is being done, and you begin to see Western society involved with it, all right? They're capitalizing, putting money in it. The military industrial complex is there to kill, to destroy, to cause death all over the place, inextricably linked with the politics of inauguration that we see today. And they're spreading it all over the world. When they say democracy, they're talking about inaugurations. Burn. You can't be anything other than that and be accepted in this society with the World Bank, an international monetary fund. All of these people are pushing forth subtly. Belier and all of his order. Let's read on, priest. Continuing in verse 5. And the persecution of the righteous by Manasseh and Tobiah the Canaanite and John of Anathoth and by Zadok the chief of the works and the rest of the acts, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And when Isaiah the Saul of Armah saw the lawlessness which was being perpetrated perpetrated in Jerusalem and the worship of Satan and his wantonness. Once again, 
This is what happened when you began to read in the book of Kings, as they were saying. When you began to see that the children of Israel put up groves and the children of Israel engaged in worship of Bailey or Baal, they was worshiping Hasatan, that mm. pantheon of evil, ratchet spirits. But once again, our Bible has been eased and smoothed over and combed over where it just looked like, you know, they was, they was having a bad day. No, they was engaged in the most ratchet of acts, which is all manner of idolatry against the Heavenly Father, which is the greatest of all commandments. So they essentially worship, it, worship Hasatan. Let's pick up the 11th verse. Verse 11. And these eat nothing save wild herbs, which they gathered on the mountains. And having cooked them, they live thereon together with Isaiah the prophet. We're going to move over to the third chapter, and we're going to pick it up in the 11 verses. We began to close out the martyrdom of Isaiah. When you began to read Isaiah and Habakkuk and all of those people, all those prophets in those days, they began to replicate what the children of Seth were doing on the holy mountain. They didn't work. They just engaged in prayer and doxologies to the Heavenly Father. And when they ate, they forged off the land. They was just like the children of Adam for a few years until the prophecies came that they had to be exterminated. But what came about to the extermination of Isaiah? This is a beautiful short book, so those who have the time, those who have the investment in the spiritual soul, definitely read this book. Pick it up in the third chapter, the 11th verse. And he brought many accusations against Isaiah and the prophets before Manasseh. But Beliar dwelt in the heart of Manasseh and in the heart of the princes of Judah and Benjamin and of the eunuchs and of the counselors of the king. So you begin to see every time you see the children of Israel going uh, awry, that they was filled with these evil, despotic spirits of sin. These evil spirits of sin that was forced to have absolutely no conception of righteousness. Everything in them is to destroy the saints. And we yielded to them. And to this day, we yield to them. We yield to their deceptive practices, and we reject the righteousness of the Most High. We're going to leave there and go to Luke, the 11th chapter and the 17th verse. We're talking about that evil spirit of Bel, Bailey, Baal, Baal. You began to see it in these names, as I said, in Jezebel, in Belbo or Babo. You begin to see them prevalent in all of those names coming for the destruction of the children of Israel. Luke eleven seventeen. But, but he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And the house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. Now he's saying if the pantheon of evil is divided, how can it stand? If you got three of them trying to do right and four doing wrong, they're going to be, you know, adverse to themselves. He's saying it is impossible. Every one of them are hell-bent on the destruction of the children of Israel. You will never have one of these evil Casbiel, Gadriel, fighting against uh, uh, Gadriel or Casbiel. You'll never find that. They all work together. This is what the Messiah was saying to the Pharisees. You don't even know the pantheon. If you call me the devil and I'm casting out devils, how did that work? When did they do that? Obviously, he's working for or he's on the side of the Elohim, righteousness. Let's read on. And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils. Look at what he's dropping. He's dropping names. If I, by Baal, Baal, Cast out devils, read. By whom do your sons cast them out? Who do you cast them out by? Because I ain't seen you cast out a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm casting out some devils. When you going to do it? Obviously, you are a devil is what he's trying to say. Read on. Therefore shall they be your judges. These devils shall be your judges. They're going to accuse you in the court is what he's saying. Read on. But if... I, with the finger of Abba Yahweh, cast out devils. No doubt the kingdom of Abba 
is come unto you. He's saying, if I'm truthfully doing what I said that I'm doing, let it be known that Raphael, Michael L., Gabriel, Melchizedek has visited you. If demons are being cast out, you are in the presence, in the aura of godliness, the Elohim, and you're rejecting it, is what the Messiah is saying to this recidivist evil. Remember, the Kohanim back in the day of Eli was already taken over, was already taken over. And so we see the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and even the Essenes going astray. All right, let's read on. Luke 11 and 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger, when, when a stronger than he uh, shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all of his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. He that is not with me is against me. So he comes back and says that you must always be stronger than the adversary. This is not a plight for the weak. You must exercise these demons at all times. You must fight against them at all times because this is a, just like in the world or just like written in, the, uh, in Scripture, it speaks about the strength of the lion taking over the prey. And so this is what we have to be. We can't be victimized. We have to be victorious in everything we do, fighting this fight in spirituality. Let's read on. But when the stronger, oh, lock in. A he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. So once again, you must choose to be the sons of the Most High, the children of Abba, or the children of the devil. He's saying if you are not with this seventh covenant, you are against it. You're either with the sons of the Most High or the sons of Hasatan. Continue. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. All right, we talked about this last week. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, when Gadriel is ripped out of a man, He's baptized, he's anointed, and a sin offering happens, and the evil spirit is gone, and you have done nothing to replace it. You do not instill or furnish in you that Holy Spirit of wisdom, virtue, and righteous acts. What do he do? Then goeth he and taketh him seven other he spirits. He go find the whole pantheon. They kicked me out. Let's go reclaim that flesh and bring elements of all seven of these demonic forces and return back into that body. Read. Seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. You know, as a footnote, this is why we don't go around just offering sin offerings to everybody. We make sure that you're in covenant, that you fully understand and comprehend the consequences that are at hand, that there is literally an obligation when you come into the seventh covenant to continue on daily eradicating trespass so that sin never grows in you ever again. So if we just willy-nilly just went to a guy on the street and cast out demons, his latter state may be worse than it was when only two dwelled in him. Mm. So we make sure that they comprehend, know, and understand that the seventh covenant is about prevailing, being strong for life. We're going to drop that and move over to Jeremiah 51, verse 44. Jeremiah 51, verse 44. And I will punish Baal and Babylon. Look at what the Heavenly Father is saying here. I will punish Baal, Bel, that dwells in Babo, all right, that city of Bel. Heavenly Father is forecasting that Babylon the Great will be destroyed, even though Belial, Baal, will be prevalent and persistent to the last days, he will indeed be punished. And we see that he enters into men. His job is to counteract that righteousness of the Most High, to extract you from worship, to extract you from worship. If Uriel is the uh, Pinimu or the Ponim, I should say, the Ponim, the face or the aura of Abba Yahweh, then we now find Belial being the opposite of it. If Uriah or Uriel means light, then we have here him being called, Belial being called darkness. 
And what is darkness? The opposite of entering into the heavenly father. And so when you see people so hell-bent and so adverse to righteousness, wanting nothing to do with righteousness, we see that Bell, Bailey, Belier has completely engulfed them and taken them over. This is the darkness that the light will enter and illuminate if they can stand it. But we find here that the children of Israel could not stand it and preferred darkness rather than light. Let's continue to read. Continuing in verse 44. And I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he had swallowed up. And the nations shall not flow together anymore unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. So the Heavenly Father goes on and forecasts that a great city of Babel shall fall. He's not talking about that ancient city of Babylon. He's speaking about Babylon the Great. And if it's great, it's because Bel, Belial, Baal has become great. As it spoke about in Daniel's the ninth chapter, because the temple was destroyed, there shall be a proliferation of sin, an overspreading of sin. The temple is the mechanism used to reduce or to bring sin into remission. What happens if you get rid of the temple? It becomes great. Sin becomes great. Mm -hmm. And so until the Heavenly Father introduced the sin offerings again, called the day of consumption, Belial will continue to grow. Mestima will begin to continue to grow. All of these Asmodeuses and all of their evil legions shall continue to grow. And it ain't a damn thing you can do about it until you enter into the seventh covenant. All of that other stuff, by I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, is pure trash. It is fictitiousness put forth to make you think you can do something. It is fighting against the enemy with a water gun. Yeah, it looks like a gun. It squirts. It's put out a little something. <laughs> but it ain't doing no damage whatsoever. None whatsoever. <laughs> And so here we find them working together. They're coming against the holy ordinances of the Heavenly Father. We find Belial pulling you from your strength, which is keeping covenant with the Heavenly Father. They all have a task and a job to do. And the more you expose them, the more you can figure out, I am a victim of Belial. I come against these things that were promoted in Scripture as strength. I am adverse to, I have been adverse to, Shabbats, high holy days. I have been adverse to keeping laws, statutes, commandments. I have been a pusher of paganism. But now is the time to confess and to go to war against these evil spirits that possess us. I know we have, by way of Hollywood, think that he is possessed. Is somebody uh, on a movie like The Exorcist, their head turning around like an aisle. That's not what possession means. All right, possession is our brothers and sisters that you see on the news every day, shooting each other, killing each other, raping each other, selling drugs to each other, kidnapping each other. All of that is someone who's completely possessed. And don't turn on TBN. That is full possession. All right? Mm -hmm. Our PTL, let's praise the Lord channel. That is the death walk. <laughs> that is the death walk. Anytime you see these guys doing all of that, that is the epicenter of Belial. They are putting forth some kind of alternative to Abba Yahweh, which is no alternative. This is what they came to our people with in times past. Worship this God. He's better than that old God. You'll see it in a moment. Let's pull up. Actually, jump down to the 49th verse, and let's pull up the chart, H1101. We talked about Belial, but if you move over one in the strong and change one of the diacritic points, um, you'll begin to see it's the same word. But it began to move over to mean Babel. All right, we'll bring that chart up. Let's read that 49th verse. Verse 49. As Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. Babylon has caused the children of Israel to be slain. Why? Belial has come into Babylon, convinced them to engage in their paganism and all their pagan ways. And we began to see one of the acts that were engaged in in time past being prevalent to this day. Those who are listening live, you understand that we're standing on the precipice of an extremely evil and wicked day. Their dishonorable pagan day called Christmas. They was doing this in antiquity. And not only this, all of these days that you may see, like Easter and all of it, these have their roots in that peg, uh, pantheon of Satan's. They're putting it forth so that you can capitulate to it 
and began to provoke the heavenly father to wrath and give them the right to rule over you after they accuse you in the court of the most high. I said it from the onset. Nobody traps anybody with something you don't like. Mm -hmm. The trap is, oh, isn't it cozy? Mm -hmm. Sipping mm -hmm. eggnog and mistletoe and yuletide mm -hmm. logs singing carols and nice movie. And it's very nostalgic. I remember when I was a child. I'm going to do the same thing to my children that was done to me. All of it is this evil vortex. Self-induced. You just keep perpetuating the things that the Heavenly Father hates. If you look into the pagan roots, it doesn't take. We go through this every year. Right. We just try to skim through this part real quick. These pagan roots you'll find, if you look up Saturnalia, you look at these are Roman festivals that was done leading up to the winter solstice. All right, and they pegged the winter solstice on December 25th. And that was the volcano eruption, just like they do today, right? Isn't it some song, 12 days, 10 days of Christmas, some yeah. crap? They do this all leading up to the climax, which is December 25th. And so we know that the Heavenly Father was not engaged in Saturnalia. We know that the Romans persecuted the saints. We know that they wanted nothing to do with the Hebrews of that age. And so when they began to so-called Christianize the saints, and I, and I use that word very loosely because the first Nazarenes who followed Christ and were called Christians were Hebrews, and they had the seventh covenant. Now, at the destruction, 65 to 70 AD, we have the Gentiles that Paul taught began to take it over. And so they began to disperse the Hebrews into all the continent and throughout the whole continent of Africa. All the way up to the Moorish time, the Ottoman time, when we began to take over Spain, Portugal, and Eastern Europe. But once again, we were a fraction of what we were. The Christians were the ones now. The Gentiles was taking over. And what did they do? They conflated this truth with all of their pagan ways. All right? When we began to see that the unholy Roman Empire, Constantine began to mandate that everybody become Christian. When you read this, he didn't offer Christianity to everybody. This was a government-sanctioned, mandated holiday, unholy day. Just like you must pay taxes, you must be a Christian. Oh, you don't want to be a Christian? We put you to death. And so, to make it palatable, oh, what you do on December 25th? We engage into Saturnalia. We engage in Yuletide law. We worship the Norse God, and we do that. Ah, let's just bring that in and just say Jesus was born on that day. Okay, uh, okay, let's make it happen. You got some write up on uh, Saturnalia? Uh, yeah, I have something. Um, I guess it's from uh, Academus okay. uh, Education. How Saturnalia became Christmas. Mm -hmm. The trans the transition from the ancient to the present and pagan to Christianity. So. Uh, there before a minute, I just put down a couple of... Why are we going through this? We're showing you that Babel, you're going to see here, are the ones that the Romans got all of this from. They got it from Babylon. Remember, one nation would fall, just like in World War II. When the Germans fell, what do you think happened to all the German scientists that was in the elite? The Germans were making jets and all types of high-end equipment that the Americans knew nothing of. You think they just killed those scientists? Absolutely not. Their grandchildren are living right now in Florida somewhere. Swiftly picked them up. It doesn't matter what kind of war crime they did. None whatsoever. Come over here. It's just that technology. And so this is what happened when the Persians took over the Babylonians. They took all of their high technology. And then the same thing when the Greeks took over the Persians, took all of their high technology. And when the Greco-Roman Empire began to evolve to only Roman, they took everything from the Greeks who robbed everything from the previous empire, including the Egyptians and including Mesopotamia. They just evolved because it is not man. It is these evil spirits dwelling within these kingdoms. And so they're transferring that knowledge from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom. And so the same thing on how to beset the children of Israel. All of these false holidays, these holidays as some of the brothers and sisters call them, all derived from Belial, these evil spirits, and they conveyed it over from kingdom to kingdom. And you would now begin to see the last of the seven heads, the Roman Empire, began to instill this into every corner of their kingdom. What do you have, priest? 
Um, it reads, the 4th century CE, uh, CE after which a new winter holiday began to be celebrated in Rome, Christmas. But now was the pagan festival of Saturnalia celebrated. And how did it influence and morph into Christmas celebration that we know and love? You can look on our channel. We have done probably over a dozen classes dealing with Christmas. Now that we're in this this, this beautiful class dealing with angels and talking about the source of these false holidays. I think time would be better spent on dealing with these evil forces and how they engage in putting forth these pagan holidays, unholy days. They bring forth the Yule log, you know. They talk about all kind of Christmas carols dealing with the Yule log. What about the holly or the mistletoe? You ever walked in and they're just hanging that over and it's about kissing? All of that has Norse roots to it. All of it is paganism. What is paganism? Paganism is essentially polyistic gods. You believe in multiple gods. And you can't be a Hebrew and you believe in multiple gods. All right, and so it is adverse to who we are in our covenant. And so they make up gods. They make up gods that they can see. This is the god of the wind and the god of fire and the god of trees. This is the god of fruit. This is the god of wine. And all of that, once again, is adverse to who we are. Who taught them this? These evil demonic forces. Once again, rule over us. And so even Santa Claus, St. Nick, have its roots in paganism. Right. I know I'm talking to a Hebrew community, but I'm never surprised when I hear an Israelite doing some weird stuff. And a uh, brother may turn around and say, St. Nick was an Israelite. <laughs> That's why I got a tree up. Hey, it is wicked. It is evil. Speaking of the tree, let's grab that in Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. In the first verse, all of us should be well studied upon this. Jeremiah was talking to the Babylonians, right? He was talking to Bel, and Bel had the children of Israel engaged in what you see today, so-called Christmas. And if you'll get that, there's a story in the Apocrypha called Bel and the Dragon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're going to read some of the excerpts from that. Going back to Bailey, Belier, Belzebub. All of it is the same. All of it is what we're going through today. In the same way, you have people hell-bent on doing Christmas today. It was the same back then. Nothing you could do could stop them from doing what they wanted to do. It's good times. I love it. History is behind it. And whatever else Satan Belial has convinced them is good, they're going to do it. The only thing you can do is be like Isaiah, preach the good news, tell them the truth, and you make sure you behave uh, accordingly. Let's read Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Got it. Go ahead. Hear ye the word which the Most High speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Most High, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. All right, so we can talk, I mean, at length about what this is talking about. But we, for, once again, time's sake and the purpose of this class, he's talking about how the Gentiles under Belial began to worship the stars of heaven. They put forth the seven planets, talking about it represents that pantheon. All right, they were saying that once again, even Saturnalia go back to Saturn. And so the seven planets are supposed to represent these seven gods of their pantheon. And then they worship them. And then on Sunday, they worshiped the sun. And on Monday, they worshiped the moon. And the months was called after their gods. And we, once again, just capitulated to their ways, not knowing it. And it doesn't matter if you know or not. Saying those names that I just said, I have to give up a trespass offering. That's just per the covenant that I've given, I've, I've entered into. Their names don't supposed to even come out of my mouth. But for edification's sake, I got to say it. All right, so we'll know what not to say, but what? Do I have in strength and power giving up an oblation when this class is over? Mm -hmm. Pray for forgiveness and let's move on so that I won't be accused in the court of the Most High. So they worshiped the stars of heaven and they made a physical representation of that as well. How did they do it? For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. So one went to the grove next to their temple, cut down that tree next to the grove because they were holly. They were holly trees or holy trees. You may know it today as 
holy wood or Hollywood. Absolutely. Well, all types of dreams can come true. <laughs> mm -hmm. They cut down the Hollywood, the unholy wood, and began to set it up in the temple. And this is what Manasseh did. I'm not going to go there, but this is exactly what he did. He brought into the Hebrew temple a Christmas tree. And this is when it was over. The other kings who were wicked did it in high places in the mountains. But he was the first one to say, forget the mountains. Bring that right here into the court of the Most High, our Abba. And when that was done, the Heavenly Father never entered into that temple again. It was over. Exactly. So there was no reason for an erected temple. He allowed the Babylonians to come and raise that thing to the ground. And even when they erected it again with the Persians, he was like, it's, it's not even a, it's like a shack. <laughs> and then when Herod started putting his little sprinkle on it, it was an abomination. It was a whorehouse. Uh -huh. And this is why at the death or the crucifixion of the Messiah, he tore that place up. And then he let Titus, Vespasian, and, and come in and utterly just burn it down. And there was never a resurrection of it again. Mosai is saying, you are now the temple. Those sacrifices must be within you. And if you're going to let them tear down the temple, let them tear down your temple, not your brother's temple. Let's say Tom Belier enter into you and destroy you and not cause your whole nation not to offer oblations. Let's read on. Continuing in verse 3. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest with the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. You know something that's very, very strange? You know, just like on Halloween, you see the church is selling pumpkins. Out here in the South, boy, they are notorious for selling these trees. Mm -hmm. They are trafficking in these abominable trees. Letting you know who rules in these churches. Yeah, uh, can I read this last part? Come, you what you got? We went into Saturnalia. Right? So I just want to read this last part so you can understand what's going on here. It says, after all that, Saturnalia was a festival that was constantly evolving, this pagan holiday. And this lends itself to a shift from pagan worship to Christian worship. Mm. So they took Saturnalia that was pagan and added it to Christianity, huh? which is the Christmas. Absolutely. Straight pagan. Stay away from it. So we see Belial convincing the Babylonians to engage in this and Israel in the Babylonian captivity to be prominent in their kingdom. You have to assimilate. They do the same thing today. If mm -hmm. anybody come from a foreign country, they don't want you speaking your language. They turn around and tell you, speak American. <laughs> speak American. They don't want you to carry on your custom. They will hold that against you. They will hold that against you. So what do you do? You may be from Venezuela, Venezuela, but you celebrating, you know, July 4th like everybody else, you know, mm -hmm. like you was born here. And if you don't, you may not, you know, your neighbors look at you funny. You don't engage in what we engage in. Again, this is what happened to the Israelites. You had to assimilate, and they did. But us assimilating is different than anybody else. Assimilation, the Heavenly Father told us not to do it. It was him and him alone, his custom, his ways, and his ways alone. Let's read. Continuing in verse 4. They fasten it with nails and with hammers. That so they cut a not. tree out of the forest, and they get a tree stand, fasten it with nails so that it stand up in their living room. Continue. Verse 5. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. Meaning they have no life in them. The tree is dead. You removed it from its roots. Read on. They must needs be born. Because they cannot go. Be so not a you, you must pick it up when they're saying born. You must bear it to go somewhere. It doesn't even have the ability to move from room to room. Yet you're calling it a god. Are you worshiping it like a god? Read on. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it, is it in them to do good. They are vain, as he said before. They have no strength, no power. Actually, they do have power. They have power to hold you back once you submit yourself to it. Mm. They have power to cause you to provoke the most high to wrath if you submit to their vanities. Continue. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O most high, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Jump down back to the fourth verse. Verse 4. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails. And so this is why it's like the heavens. The whole purpose of this tree is that it is the spans of heaven. 
And all of the lights on it are like the twinkling stars. And the top of it is the big star. And so when you worship the queen of heaven, what does she give at the bottom of the tree? Yeah. Gifts, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and so the bowing down, the worship of this custom, whether you know it or not, has pagan roots. And it used to be more in front of your face uh -huh. in times of old, but now it's all cloistered in the jollies of Christianity. And don't worry about the minutia of it. Just get in it and have a good time and get your new PlayStation and your new bicycles and your new clothes. And it just make it all good when you engage in this. When you engage in this, you get gifts from heaven. When you engage in this worship, you get the gifts of the queen of heaven. Now, once again, time will not afford us, but the children of Israel engaged in worship of the queen of heaven. And they said, Any t since we've engaged in this, we have received blessings. Yeah. We will not go back to Abba Yahweh. What was the blessings? Commissioned by the state. It was like a form of welfare. It was like a PPP loan. Just getting that money. Mm -hmm. He was like, I ain't never got a PPP loan from Abba Yahweh. You got the kingdom from him. You got the whole world. You need a loan. So, once again, the same thing is being practiced today. You had something? Yeah, and I was going to say at the heart of this festival, um, it said the holiday was celebrated with a sacrifice at the temple of Saturn in a Roman forum in a public banquet followed by private gift giving, continual partying, and a carnival atmosphere that overturned Roman social norms. So basically debauchery, they was wilding. Sex, orgies, whatever, gambling, all that was taking place on this day. And so, you know, when we talk about these holidays and you want to go eat some of that coked out ham and turkey or whatever else it may be, you are partaking in that sacrifice at this temple of Saturn. So I just want to add that. Done. Absolutely. And you cannot be partakers of it. Let's grab that bell and the dragon. The temptation is going to come. <clears throat> temptation is going to come. Every year, it used to come. It don't come anymore to me. Uh, anybody that gave me gifts, just like the toll mood, Fresh. they get chucked. I practice my football kicking. <laughs> <laughs> Try to hit a field goal with that thing. And uh, I don't even look. I don't care if I get a secret package in the mail. I don't even look. I'm not even tempted. It may be something I really need. I don't need it. Because engaging in that, once again, is the greatest of all trespasses. Choose this day who you will serve. Will you serve Abba Yahweh? Or will you serve Belier? Will you engage in the pagan customs and traditions? We're not going to go through it. There's a lot of brothers and sisters. Even Christians are now catching wind and getting hip to this. Yeah. A lot of them have denounced, renounced Christianity. It's all over the web. Just Google it yourself. Just do a little search. You can see yeah. the pagan roots to it. And the sad thing is you see people don't want to depart from it, and they make up all kind of excuses. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus' birthday. It's his birthday. What are you talking about? And my ch it's for the children. Right. Yeah. We don't really get into it, but it's, it's for the children. You know, think about in antiquity, right? There was a time in America where there was some serious lynching going on. And imagine somebody was at one of the lynchings and said, you know, I, I was just there. And I was just saying hurrah. I just handed him a whip. I just took pictures of the dead body hanging from the tree. I wasn't really into it. You was in it. Mm -hmm. You was there. You was not adverse to it. You was not trying to stop it. What did Christ just say uh, 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 an hour ago? He that is not with me is against me. Uh -huh. And he's against that pagan roots of Christianity or Christmas. And anybody by any means that's taking part in it is taking part of Bell's rituals. And these rituals were put here for one reason. Once again, we covered it from the beginning. He is adverse to Adam. I will kill you and all of your offsprings, knowing that this is one of the great provocative, provocative things you can do against the Heavenly Father is engage. Everything is, that's wicked is wicked. But there are degrees to this. There are degrees to this, and this is the top of the list. And so once again, they make it sweet. They make it sound gentle. They make it sound like something that is godly. Go give to the Salvation Army. Don't give them anything. Anything. I know it's a ritual. It's a custom amongst you. All of this giving is created by Belial. Huh. Bell. Wickedness. 
and I want to add priests that are, you know, just just abstain from their appearance of evil. Don't even, even if it looks like it, don't even do it. You know what I mean? Just, just you know, abstain from it, you know? Uh, I, I, won't, I won't say that, you know, like even if you want to wear red and green around this time, you know, you might want to think about, I don't know if I want to do that. Not to say that that is evil, but I'm just, just the mindset is just to be completely Maybe to separate. ward off the Merry Christmas, brother. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're in the Christmas spirit. Now you got to explain. Right. Yeah. You know, you're right. I'm saying from all presence of evil. This, this is some evil time. And, you know, if you could be reclusive, be reclusive. But those who have to go out and deal with it, go out and deal what you have to deal with. But be strong, knowing that any participation in that is a demise of your soul. And those who are righteous, as I said before, you want to make sure your chamber of imagery stay clean. Uriel, Raphael, Gabriel will not come to you if Christmas carols are echoing in your chamber of imagery. Or if you're anticipating tomorrow, I wonder what gift I'm going to get. Or what am I going to give little Timmy? He wanted a bicycle. He wanted a, right. a PlayStation. I'm going to, all of that right there is separating you from the most high. And even, like I said, some of us who become knowledgeable are tempted, not by the gifts. We can get over that. And we can get over the food, but... We're tempted to go meet family that didn't come together. I ain't seen them in five years. Let's go check them out. And what that means is frolicking with them, engaging in all of that, sitting down, watching them open the gifts and, and all manner of paganism. And that entering into your chamber of imagery once again, if you value that supreme message from the Elohim, you would abstain from all appearance of evil. We didn't go on in Ezra's when Uriel spoke to Ezra's. He told him to go into a field and stay away from the people. They would distract you. And they did that. They came to him with all kind of pressures. He was like, get out of here. I see why Uriel told me to keep my chamber of imagery clean. Now, these were Israelites who knew who they were. How much more so these folk out here that doesn't have a, don't have a clue. You have to keep your chamber of imagery clean. Uh, can I read this uh, insert? Um, this is the same document that I was reading how Saturnalia became Christmas. It says the connection with midwinter and the birth of Jesus Christ wasn't made until the second century CE. So this is hundreds of years after his death. Right. And the first known celebration of Christmas celebration of the birth of Christ is from 354 CE. And it says regardless, right? They don't really know what time he was born, but regardless, there is no evidence that the widely celebrated date of Christmas was actual was the actual date in the birth of the Messiah. The date, December 25th, specifically, likely comes from the Roman festival, and it says, I think it's Latin, dies natalis, solus, invictus, the day of the birth of the unconquered son. So it's not his birthday. Is going back to paganism, the worship of the sun or Saturn. Uh, and you get more understanding if you get the calendrical study guide that after the winter, the solstice, <clears throat> the longest night of the year, the sun begins to rise from that point. And so, you know, in a lot of these, um, you know, uh, false religions and things like that, they worship this because of fertility and, you know, a good harvest. You know, they want to make sure that they appease a God so they, they would have a bountiful harvest. And look how that relates to what we're doing now on the Feast of Weeks, you know. Um, of course, it's, it's similar, but it, it, it's definitely not the same. So it's, uh, it relates. You know, you'll see the, the, um, the similarities in it, you know. And you, like I said, you can find that out in the calendrical study guide as you look at how the, the – the, you know, the, the cycle of the sun and the moon um, when it talks about the Enoch parts with the sun and the moon. But I just want to add that. Uh, yeah. You have more on that, Priest? Uh, that's good on that. I mean, there's a whole lot. Uh, but nonetheless, this document pretty much goes into the facts that uh, Christmas is not Jesus' birthday. It is coming from a pagan holiday, Saturnalia. And everything that's dealing with uh, Christianity, Christmas is all similar to Saturnalia. And we know that in the scriptures, there's no celebration of Christ's birthday or birth. Where is that in the scriptures? 
What does he tell us to celebrate his birth? It's not there. Right. Anything else on that, priest? No, I didn't have anything. Gone. Um, let's segue for a moment. We're going to come right back there because uh, we see, even though this is not the birthday of the Messiah, and if it was, it wouldn't be a, a high holy day. It wouldn't be a day to come together. You know, it's almost like the day he was circumcised. We're going to come together and, you know, and, and give gifts to each other. Just you make him the object of worship now, as opposed to him being that mediator head over the Allah or Elohim for us to worship the most high. Now, with that said, there are some that go overboard. I know those who have walked in this wall for quite some time have heard just because of that birthdays are wicked and evil. Mm -hmm. You can't celebrate birthdays. And this is completely wrong. And then they will go and say that Pharaoh celebrated his birthday and he murdered people. And then he'll go over here and say John the Baptist was beheaded at, you know, birthday. You know, all of these things are true, but it doesn't make or give a prohibition against celebrating a birthday. All right? Just because they did something wicked with it, just like we find with the heathen away. We can't be superstitious, as Paul said. The heaving a wave in the scriptures is raising up the bread and heaving or waving and heaving the wine. We can say, hey, hey they do that cross thing. We, we ain't with that. We'll never learn what the Most High has that is acceptable for us if we let them desecrate something righteous and then we turn around and abstain from it. That's a bit superstitious. And so we're going to go to Judges, the 11th chapter, if you will. Quick story, side note, since we're talking about the birth even though we don't celebrate the birth of Jesus, we know that there was an acknowledgement of a birth. They speak about his age. They speak about Adam's age. Man. So they acknowledge these things. So for us to act like these things did not exist would be completely wrong. It would be completely off. And so once again, we come putting prohibitions on people that are not prohibited. And so we must be aware of these things. Let's start off at Judges 11 and 1 real quick. We're going to try to zoom through this. Now, Jephthah, the Gileadite, or Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. And Gilead begot uh, Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him a son, and his, wife, and his wife's son grew up, and they thrusted out Jephthah and said to him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house. All right, this is a whole other story, but I will talk about it. He was the son of a concubine, not a harlot. This word here is a concubine. And that was a woman that he did not, the father did not marry, so he was alienated from all the rights. And when you read the story, you find his brethren from the wife that had married the husband turned around and said, you will not inherit anything because you are alienated. All right, you did not enter into the inheritance because our father didn't do right by you. But that's not the story today. All right, let's read on. The third verse. Actually, jump down to the 30th verse. The, the story here is not the point. All right, it's the point of what he did after he vowed his vow. Let's read. And Jephthah vowed and vowed unto the heavenly father and said, If thou wilt, uh, if thou shalt, Without fail, deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands. Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon. All right, just giving a little backstory, not to break down the entire story. He was alienated from his inheritance, and the enemy came amongst the children of Israel. He was a mighty man. And they said, if you fight for us, we'll let you back in your inheritance. And he said, I'll do that. But before he fought, he went and vowed to the Heavenly Father, if you allow me to be victorious, anything to come out of my house, I'm going to sacrifice it to you. The doors of my house, I'll, I'll make that sacrifice to you. I'll, I'll give that to you as a free will offering. Let's read. Uh, the 31st verse. Then it shall be that whatsoever come forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, uh, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the heavenly father delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from uh, Aurora, even till thou come to Minnith. 
even 20 cities, and unto the plains of the vineyard with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Misphet unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with thimbles and with dance, and she was his only child. So we now see here, he asked the Heavenly Father, you allowed me to be victorious. First thing come out of the doors of my house, I will give it to you as an offering. And the father came through on his deal, his end of the bargain, and delivered the enemy into his hand. And he was rejoicing, filled with jubilation, forgot what he had vowed to the Most High. Mm. Came home rejoicing, dancing, probably imbibing a little. Looked at his first, at his door, and his daughter came out celebrating with him. And instantly he remembered what he vowed. Oh. First thing come out of my door, I will sacrifice it unto thee. Let's read. And besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast bought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth to Abba Yahweh, and I cannot go back. So I've made a vow, and there's no way to go back. Now those who have entered into the covenant, you made a vow to the Most High, and you can't go back. Mm. I know at this time he wanted to go back. Can I go back and, yeah. and, and, and redo that? The same way we make a vow, there is no going back. And I'm telling you, if Jephthah would have turned around and said, man, I'm not sacrificing Ooh. my daughter. I meant mm. the first lamb, <laughs> rat, you. It would have been trouble. It would have been the angel visiting him. Yeah. It came out of your mouth. You have to fulfill it. Now, I know what you're saying. Human sacrifice, that's not right. Let's hear the story. And she said unto him, my father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto Abba Yahweh, do to me according to that which has proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as Abba Yahweh has taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me, and let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity. I am my fellow. She is bewailing her virginity. She has never married a man. This is a key point in understanding what is happening here. Let's read. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her of virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass that at the end of the two months, she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And he did what he vowed. He sacrificed her. Does this mean he cut off her head and spilled her blood? Absolutely not. We just read about Samuel. If you read the story about his mother, she vowed too. Yeah. If you allow me to get pregnant, I will give my child to you. I will tithe him unto thee. And so Jephthah had to tithe his daughter, his only daughter, who was a virgin, never married to the church, and she will never marry again. She will be there working in the church all the days of her life. He couldn't redeem her back either. He couldn't redeem her back, absolutely not. He gave her. She was a Nazarite at that point. She belonged to the church. Now, why did I bring that up? Let's read on. And she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel. This became a custom. Israel began to come around every year to acknowledge this. Let's read. And it be, uh, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gilead, uh, the Gilead, the Gilead, the Gilead, the Gileadite, for four days in a year. So they went every year to mourn her death, so to speak, every year. So why is it a trespass to mourn your life coming into the covenant of the Most High? Listening to these simple ones who are overrighteous and underwise will have you doing all kind of things that is not a trespass. This is what Belial loved. They love false trespasses put out for you trying to tiptoe through the raindrops, trying to be righteous. That has nothing. A birthday has nothing to do if you're not doing the pagan ways of the Gentile. You're not getting the cake. You're not putting on these little pointed hats. Yeah. You're not singing these stupid songs. If you want to sit back and acknowledge this is the day, I want to give up my oblation to the Most High. I want to sit back, take my wife out to dinner or take my child out, whatever it may be. We're just celebrating a revolution here on this planet. 
They celebrated a revolution when she was dedicated to the church. It was a somber thing. They lamented. If they can do that in a, you know, lamentable situation, you can do it in rejoicing. It is an anniversary. You, you want to talk about the day that you and your husband or wife got married and every year you celebrate that? Nothing wicked with that. But let these underrighteous camp tell you that that's wicked too. Nothing wrong with acknowledging and becoming festive on the day you were born or day someone else was born. Once again, just steer away from what the pagans are doing. All right? They're adding all types of, you know, foolishness in it that turns into a stumbling block for the children of Israel. All right, so we're talking about the birth of the Messiah. It's not specific about his birth. It does tell us the season, but we're not even getting into that because we're not doing something special on that day. All right? So that's not a day that you engage in anything. All of that is Norse belief, paganism, believing in this pantheon of multiple gods that these pagans have thrown out. We're now moving over to Bell and the Dragon in the Apocrypha as we began to try to stem this class to a close. I know it's a long class, but this information has to come out. And as we began to move on talking about these other angels, we can use this for our benefit. What are we doing? We're seeing the trap that was placed here before us. These traps are placed here before us so that we can fall and become victims and so that they can leave the invisible realm and visit the physical. They love dwelling in you. This is why what Paul said in Romans 7, they enter into you, and when they possess you, the things you want to do, you don't. And the things you don't want to do, you find yourself doing it. It's no longer I, it is sin that dwells within me. And if you are a righteous man, when he's finished and he's spit you up, you feel like trash. You be asking questions like, why did I do that? It wasn't you, it was sin. Now go do something about that sin. Stop hiding him. The first thing is that don't tell nobody that. <laughs> don't you dare tell nobody what you just did. And you go and hide that. I ain't do nothing. I did not do anything. You may not tell anybody, but confess it to Abba Yahweh. This is why the oblations, we're not here. To, Brother, tell them what you did. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will be talking about sin. I ain't do nothing, brother. I, I, you know, whatever. Tell it. Tell it to the Most High. Confess it so that it can be removed. Bell and the Dragon, Apocrypha, first chapter, first verse. Bell in here, going back to Beliar, going back to Belzebub, going back to Bailey. Let's read on. As King of Stages was gathered to his father, and Cyrus of Persia received his kingdom. And Daniel conversed with the king and was honored above all his friends. Now, Babylon, or Babylons, had an idol called Bel. And there, was, uh, and there were uh, spent upon him every day 12 great measures of flour and four sheep and six vessels of wine. So now we're beginning to see the essence of pagan worship in Babylon. We began to see Baal being put forth and bringing forth gifts. And so they did this daily of the king's retinue. He was rich, so bring gifts daily to this God. And the local folk brought it forth once a year on December 25th, worshiping Nimrod, bringing forth gifts to a tree so that they can be blessed by the God of heaven or the queen of heaven. But let's continue. And the king worshipped it and went daily to adore it. But Daniel worshipped his own Abba. And the king said unto him, Why doest now, why doest not thou worship Baal? Who answered and said, Because I may not worship idols made with hands, but the living Abba, who has created the heavens and the earth and has sovereignty over all flesh. So without even belittling the idols of Belial, he simply said, I cannot worship these inferior idols. I worship the sovereign, the true living God. Read on. And he said unto the, and he said to the king, or then said the king unto him, thinkest thou not that Bel is a living power? Just like when you talk to somebody about Christianity, you think Christianity is bad? So the king was fully believing that it was good. Let's read. See it thou not how much he eateth and drinketh every day. He turned around and said, look at all the gifts being opened. He's eating all the food that I put out there for him. Have you ever gone to a Chinese restaurant and you see that little statue there? 
Mm-hmm. See oranges and little food there. They're feeding their God, Gone. too. They're feeding their God. Right in front of your face. Gone, absolutely. And so they was doing the same thing here. He looked around and said, look at the altar, all the food strewn all over the place, wine being consumed. Surely Baal, when we leave, drinks and eats that stuff, right? How did Daniel respond? <laughs> I might as well say he laughed in the <laughs> scorn. <laughs> then Daniel smiled and said, O king, be not deceived. He said, king, don't be that silly. <laughs> <laughs> you too prominent to be that silly. Let's read. For this is but clay within and brass without and did never eat or drink anything. So the king was wroth and called his priests and said unto them, if ye tell me or if ye tell me not who this is that devoured these uh, expenses, ye shall die. That's like a regular person finding out, you tell me the Santa Claus is not real. You tell me right now all this money I done went into debt, buying all these presents is for Hasatan. You tell me right now. If you don't, I'm going to kill you. That's mm. what the king was saying. Let's read. But if you can certify me that Bell devoured them, then Daniel shall die. Mm. He said, here, yeah, straight up. If you can prove to me that Bell is eating all this stuff, I'm going to kill Daniel right here. Daniel wasn't worried, not one. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he was laughing and smiling. Let's read. For well, he has spoken blasphemy against Bell. Your God. Read. And Daniel said unto the king, let it be according to thy word. <laughs> let it be done. Daniel said, I'm down with that. If this God is real and he's eating up these sacrifices. Put me to death instantly. Now the, now the priest of Bell were three score and ten, besides their wives and children. And the king went to Daniel into the temple of Bell. So Bell's priest said, Lo, we go out. But thou, O king, set on the meat and make ready the wine and shut the door fast and seal it with thine own signet. So they went into the room, their little temple, and they furnished it with all manner of delicacies, all manner of wine and meats and all of that. And the king closed the door, there's nobody in it, and put his own seal of his ring on it. That's for you. And tomorrow when thou cometh in, if thou findest not that Bell has eaten up all, we will suffer death. He said, if you come back tomorrow and if Bell didn't come here and drink the drink offerings and eat it up, we'll put ourselves to death. Let's read. Or else Daniel uh, that speaketh falsely against us. And they, uh, and they little regarded it. For under the table they had made a private entrance. Ah, they was confident. Because under their oblation table, they had a little trick sneak door. What did they do with the trick little sneak door? Read. Whereby they entered in continually. They came into the room. And consumed those things. Just like Santa Claus coming down the chimney. All right? Ain't no Santa Claus coming down that chimney. That's Papa. That's Dad coming through there. Yeah. Masquerading, pretending to be that thing. Let's read. So now... When they were gone forth, the king set meat before Baal. Now Daniel had commanded his servants to bring ashes, and those, uh, and those they straw throughout all the temple. So before they completely left, all right, he let the priest of Baal leave. Daniel consorted with the king and brought ashes and just strewn them all over the floor like powder. And said, all right, now let's seal it up. Let's read. And those they strewed throughout all the temple in the presence of the king alone, when they went out and shut the door and sealed it with the king's signet, and so departed. Now in the night came the priests with their wives and children, and they that what to do uh, were, were wont to do, and did eat and drink uh, up all. In the morning, be time the king arose and Daniel with him. And the king said, Daniel, where? Uh, said, Daniel, are the seals whole? And he said, yay, king. So all through the night, the trap door was utilized. We have the priests, their wives, and their children going through, having a feast, eating everything so that they can deceive the king. And then the morning came around. Everybody gathered at the door. The king told Daniel, is that seal good? Told the priest, is the seal good? He said, it's good. Nobody has been in this place. Let's read. 
And as soon as he opened the door, the king looked at the table and cried with a loud voice, Great art thou, O Baal, with thee is no deceit at all. Wow. And so we have him, just like our brothers and sisters are engaged in Christmas, uh, promoting how right it is, how good it is, just at the trickery and all the septifuge that has been put out there, they are fully with it. You can tell right here the king wanted to believe it. As soon as he saw the stuff <laughs> eating, he was like, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. This is good right here. I worship that good God. You're telling me my God. God is good. He eat up all the stuff. <laughs> and what did Daniel say? Who was getting ready to be put to death? Then laugh. Daniel you laugh. <laughs> King, you silly boy. <laughs> silly. Silly dude. Let's read on. And held the king. Uh, and, and held the king that he should not go in. Whoa, whoa. Stop right yeah, here. Oh, stop. Don't nobody go in here and tamper with this evidence. <laughs> Read. And said, Behold now the pavement, and mark well those footsteps, or mark well whose footsteps are these. We sprinkled ashes on the floor, and I'm seeing footsteps in the ashes. What kind of footsteps? The king said, I see the footsteps of men, women, and children. I see baby footsteps. I, Baal ain't a baby? I see footprints of men. Read. The king was angry and took the priests with their wives and children who showed him the private or the private doors where they came in and consumed such things as were upon the table. Once again, they were deceived by Belial back then. They don't have the power to come up and eat anything. We read in Jeremiah 10 that they have no power. The tree has no life. Don't fear them. They cannot eat. They cannot drink. They can't talk. They can't do good. They can't do bad, let alone consume of sacrifices left out for them. It is impossible. And so Daniel, by way of the spirit, let out a trap for him. And they were so busted that they began to confess in front of the king. And the king did what he vowed, just like Jephthah. But this time he vowed to put them to death, and he put them to death. Let's read. Therefore, the king slew them and delivered Baal into the hands, or delivered Baal into Daniel's power, who destroyed him and his temple. So he delivered the idol into Daniel's hand, and Daniel utterly obliterated, but that wasn't the end. Let's read. And in the same place, there was a great dragon, which they of Babylon worshiped. We've covered this already. When we talked about the sixth day, they translated it as well. But Tanin is dragon. And so not only did they worship one of that pantheon, Belial, they worshiped the whole pantheon, the dragon. And this is that old serpent, the devil. And so it went from one idol to worshiping all the idols. And we're not going to go through this whole story, but the rest of it give you the details about the lion's den. That whole lion den is talking about what's going to happen to the saints for seven days. We're going to be thrown in the lion's den. And on the seventh day, the Mosai is going to take us out and everybody that put us in the lion's den is going to be placed in the lion's den to be utterly destroyed. But we're going to move over to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, priest regime. The Most High told us in Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, that when you build your temple, do not have any groves nor Christmas trees, any of those things tethered to this temple. You do it exactly to what the forefathers has been given. It is an earthly resemblance of the spiritual temple of the Most High. And anything other than that is bringing in these ways of wickedness that cause the Most High to recoil out of your presence. Let's get 1 Kings 18 and verse 17 that talks about this same situation that we were just going through. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? So now we now have Ahab, the king of Judah, marrying a Gentile named Jezebel. We spoke about that before. And so she has convinced her husband to kill anybody that's worshiping the Most High, and they must worship El. She brought forth her 400 prophets, prophets and her priests and made sure that all Israel consent. Now, all the saints and prophets who was righteous just ran into the mountains. They wouldn't do it. So under the rest, they just ran. 
and began to worship the Most High in secret. And Elijah was one of them until the spirit came upon him to say, confront Ahab to his face mm. and let him know how wicked he is and condemn him. Let's read. Verse 18. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Most High, and thou hast followed Balaam. Remember, we have Uriah, which is the light, the aura, the face, Paunim of the Most High, meaning closeness to the Most High. Baal, Balaam, Belier is here to take you from the Most High. They are arch nemesis. And so anything that is adverse is put forth by that demonic force. And so we have to be greater than it. We have to always be reliant on the light, the will, the Most High. Let's continue. Verse 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So the grove, once again, these trees that produce the fruit for them to sacrifice to their pagan entities, their deities. And they cut these trees down. Some of them they made totem poles out of, little gods that were carved. And others, they put in and obviously put forth the Christmas trees that Jeremiah spoke about. The thing that we now call a Christmas tree. It wasn't for Christ back then. It wasn't a Christmas tree. It was toward Nimrod. And so they once again just incorporated it in what is now known as Christianity, but still have all of its pagan fire and trespasses to it. All right, we're going to pause for a second. It says, those that eat at Jezebel's table. The most I spoke about Jezebel. And we're going to talk about her etymology and her Hebrew roots to that name. Get Revelations 2.18, if you will. And then to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the son of Abba, who has his eyes like unto the flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. All right. He's talking to the church of Thyatira, which is the fourth of seven churches. As we said before, each one of these churches in Revelation represent a millennium in the 7,000 years. This would be the fourth millennium, and you will see it in his actions. The fourth millennium is from the time of Solomon building the temple all the way to the time of the Messiah, 1,000 years in between. All right. Let's continue. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou has suffereth that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. When did that happen? In the fourth millennium after the fall of Adam. All right, she came in. She was married to Ahaz, one of the kings, right before 3500 when the temple was destroyed. He said, I have a problem with Jezebel. Continue. Uh, the, uh, who calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Here we go. So what we're going through today, seducing, convincing, beguiling my people to engage in totem poles, Christmas, paganism, false holidays. He said, I have a problem with that. You are that first, fourth church of Thyatira. You let that happen. Let's read. And I gave her space to repent for her fornication and she repented not. And they didn't repent, which means convert. They didn't convert back over. They kept going with Beliar. And again, the meaning of that church, Thyatira, means temple of sacrifice. That happens in the fourth millennium where the temple was built at the time of Solomon. It was also destroyed in that fourth millennium. And then, once again, tried to erect it again. But he's talking about that fourth millennium church. And Jezebel lived in that fourth millennium. Let's read. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her. And this is not talking about what the world is talking about. Jezebel was a sexual deviant. No, she wasn't. She was married to Ahab. All right? She was a spiritual fornicator. She caused Israel to go astray from their marriage with their heavenly father. Her issue is not being promiscuous or seductive or licentious. Her thing is idolatry. Fine. Once again, low level, always push. She's a Jezebel. A Jezebel. Right. Right. That's not what it's talking about. Again, it's talking about spiritual fornication. Let's continue. Go to chapter and verse. Revelation 2 and 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So anybody 
that is engaged with the paganism, the abominations, any parts of what Belial is bringing forth, what Jezebel, Bailey, have brought forth, he will cast thee away. And so this is why it's so important, critically important, that we separate ourselves from anything of it. Once you learn about it, you now have the charge, the power, to show the Heavenly Father how firm you will stand against it. Now, you don't have to become a zealot going out there, breaking in houses and burning down Christmas trees. <laughs> Just keep it out of your periphery. Keep it out. And even with the family, you, you, you don't have to cuss them out. Yeah, you teach them they don't want to hear it. You should shut it down. Move yeah, on. Keep going. And hopefully, at one time, they will become the knowledgeable of it, and then they'll seek it from you. What was you saying about that tree? That may be five years from now. And then teach them patiently, but make sure it doesn't come in your domain. We're going to pull up the Strong's on Jezebel. On Jezebel, it is Strong's H34. No, H348, 348. And once again, the... The bell portion of it is Bailey, and the first portion of it, Isaiah, is talking about exalts. And so this is one who Baal exalts. And by inference, it's talking about being married in covenant with Baal. So you in covenant with Baal, you exalt him, you praise him. And so this is who she was. This is what she was named. One who exalts Balaam, a liar. All right, Beelzebub. All of it is all balled up as one. Exactly. Married unto him. All right, let's go back to 1 Kings where you were. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long, how, how long halt ye between two opinions? Mm -hmm. If the Most High be Abba Yahweh, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So he said what we're saying today. How long are you going to be caught between two opinions? How are you going to have the opinion that Christmas is pagan, but yet still you're lukewarm? You're going over and celebrating it. Are you fraternizing? Are you still giving gifts? Saying that family may be disappointed if I don't. Who you have an allegiance to? Your family, more than the Most High? Then stick with them. They cannot save you. The Most High saves. So now's the time at this moment, standing on that precipice of this eve of this pagan day to stand firm and say, I may lose some friends. I may lose some family. But I will not engage in that thing that's provocative. It provokes the Heavenly Father to wrath. And so in the rest of the story, if you continue to read on, we have Elijah saying straight up, your gods are no gods. And so they have proof and evidence. God that answered by fire in the ninth lot, let him be deemed the heavenly father. And so obviously, Balaam, just like with, with Daniel, could not stand the test of faith. The Most High came through and proved himself to be the true power. We have the heavenly father bringing forth Abundance of evidence that these dark entities are hell-bent at sacking us. And they put forth this tree, and to be honest with you, this tree that they put forth is a perfunctory copy of the tree of life. After the flood, Noah came back and showed them the true essence to the tree of life. And we have those of Ashur and Mesopotamia beginning to leave the roots that Noah put forth and began to put forth every other thing, and put forth the queen of heaven. This was the initial Babylon, or Babel. And obviously, the Egyptians took over, and then Babylon and Assyria came afterward, and it became that Neo-Babylon. But everything we're talking about essentially came from the corruption of the tree of life that the Heavenly Father put forth in those, latter day, uh, in those earlier days by Noah, and they corrupted it. So now's the time for us to comprehend and see that the most I have working in this realm right now, an angel of light, an angel of health, an angel that brings us into the sanctuary, which we have covered already, and you have demonic forces fighting against that. And these demonic forces are doing everything within their power to cause that 
apostate mindset to sit and rest within your chamber of imagery. We're going to end the class on that. We're going to do what we always do. We're going to open up the class for anybody that may have any questions about what we're covering here. What it all distills down to is that the Most High has blessed us graciously with a covenant. And it's the final covenant. There's no more covenants coming after this. It is the seventh covenant. He blessed us with a covenant with Adam. He didn't have to. He could have gave Adam the same fate that he gave the Satans. No more covenants for you. Now, after Adam's covenant matured, he built the covenant with Noah. Noah sacrificed on the top of Mount Ararat, consecrating his covenant. And the Most High gave him a sign of his covenant called the rainbow. And then he came with a third covenant, and that was the covenant with Abraham. And then Isaac had his independent own covenant. He did not bear Abraham's covenant. He had his own covenant as written in Scripture. And Jacob had his own covenant that he bore. He did not bear Isaac's covenant, which some mistakenly put forth. And then after him, obviously, we know the sixth covenant is the covenant of Moses. And the Heavenly Father, at that point, at the end of that covenant, began to consummate, create, authorize a covenant with David. Now, the covenant with David stood fallow right, for a thousand years. It could not be consecrated, or there was nobody on this earth worthy, flawless, sin-free, that could sprinkle blood upon it. The priesthood, the Kohanim had already been corrupted. Nobody was worthy to do it. Even Solomon himself wasn't worthy to sprinkle blood upon his father's covenant. And after Solomon, it only went downward from after that, from that point. And so the Most High sent Malak Zadok, who is over that pantheon of righteous angels, in the flesh to come back as a man to consecrate David's covenant. This is why he had to come of the loins of David. And he did come of the loins of David. From his mother, she was of the offspring of David. So through David's loins, the Most High brought forth he who can consecrate David's covenant. And then after the consecration, that covenant lay fallow for nearly 2,000 years. So after the Messiah put his blood on that covenant, consecrating it, it was active at that moment. But as prophesied, all men of life die. And so we went through uh, decade after decade, century after century, millennium, knowing, not knowing that that covenant was right there and we could fight sin with a spiritual sacrifice. Now, at the end of the sixth millennium, he is now resuscitating, waking us up to the fact that there is a seventh covenant. Take it, embrace it, and now begin to destroy sin and get rid of all your trespasses. And then, once you begin to get rid of your trespasses, abstain from wickedness that is around you so that you don't have to give up a trespass. The race is about cups filled with liquids, all right? You've been filled with that dark, toxic sewage that Hasatan, Belier, Mistema, Asmodeus been putting in you. You got to start getting rid of it now. Call trespass offerings. If you keep letting them fill your cup up, you're doing nothing but burning your, your tires in one place. So abstain from trespasses and give trespass offerings to clean the cup so that when the return of the Messiah, the most high coming again upon this earth, he see that your righteousness outweigh your trespasses and sin. And you will be welcomed into that seventh millennium, that time of rest. All right, so we're going to open it up for anybody have any questions about what we have covered today. So uh, hence the saying, let not your sins weigh you down. Con, con, let not your sins weigh you down. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Con. Shalom, Prince. Shalom, Prince. Shalom. Shalom. Um, Shalom um, House of Wisdom family. Um, my first question is, um, oh, yeah, wonderful class, as always. Um, my first question is going is based off of uh, Revelations. Um, you just went over it. We're uh, talking about Jezebel in Revelations 2 and 18. I noticed that uh, you, you said that dur during this time, it was during the fourth millennium. Um, I can't help but notice that it's it's the fourth church on uh, 
um in the in the order going down to the seven churches so um is it safe to say that all the churches in order are literally talking about which millennium that they're in absolutely okay same cool. way as the seal same as the vial same as the trumpets mm. was it the first seal second third fourth seal is that pertaining to the fourth millennium mm. now yeah. if you move over to the sixth church church philadelphia that's our church we're in the sixth millennium He's saying that eventually brotherly love is going to grow from that church. That's what's going to happen at the very end. And I like the fact that we have observed that he chastised every church except our church. Mm -hmm. See, they had strength. They knew who they were. We knew not who we were. He said, you got a little strength. Just take that little strength you got and keep doing what you're doing. Uh -huh. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We have no chastisement. Just create brotherly love. That lets you know, too, that we're going to be so decimated in the sixth millennium. There's going to be a transatlantic slave trade. There's going to be all types of misdemeanors, Asmodeus, Beliars, more demons that we're going to talk about. There's going to be complete ignorance. Gross darkness shall cover the earth, and we're still going to find out who we are. And we're still going to hold on to it. That's going to be a miraculous event. This is a miraculous event, and it's happening right now, absolutely. That fourth church of Thyatira represents the fourth millennium. So, and, and that fourth millennium is talking about the time that Solomon built the temple all the way to approximately the time of the Messiah, the prince. Everything between there represents that fourth millennium. Since Adam, all right, that's what we're counting. We're not counting backwards like they do. No B.C. or any of that stuff. Everything is contingent upon Adam. When Adam fell, the Mosai said, you have 5,500 years, and then the curse of the ground is going to be 1,500 years. You add all, to get, all that together, that's how long you got. So if you're in prison, there's no B.C., there's no C.E. Now you counting down. You're putting them X's on the wall. Yeah. This is what I got left. And so we're doing a 7,000-year bid. And so we're counting it down. And what a beautiful thing how it should be. Even if you, know, if you was doing seven years or you know, whatever, and you at the six-year, 10th month, you're like, wow, two more months, baby, I'm going to be free. Back on the streets again. That's the mindset that we should have. We're going to be free. But what happened when you become, you know, um, I forgot what they call it, but you come indoctrinated with the prison system. You're so acclimated to prisons. You don't want to be free. You, you want the prison. They had that in Shawshank Redemption. You saw that? They let the man free. He didn't know what to do. Killed himself. So used to the prison, even if you got free, you walk in the street with shanks. You selling Lucy's. You're doing all kind of prison stuff in the free realm. Those kind of people will not be free, all right? Those people who really desire freedom and to put off the shackles of prison are going to be the ones that shall be set free. And I say that because the Most High is saying nothing corrupt is coming into his kingdom. If you still have a prison mindset, you will be left in prison. And we see it because of antiquity, right? When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, you had some prison-minded people. Yeah. It was like, huh, I want the leeks, the melons, and the restaurants we ate in Egypt, and I want to worship our pagan God, and, our and even though they was free, had their own country, they began to act like peasants. So, yes, absolutely, my brother. All right. So, um, also, I wanted to say, um, in doing that, keeping the covenant is pretty much being equal to, like, hearing and keeping Abba's words, and us being, in, being you know, the, uh, the Church of Philadelphia, having these chances to be able to get it right. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask about the, uh, about the angels and if, if the angels have anything to do with, um, with us being able to have the armor to be able to deal with the demons that are dealing with us. Like, um, are, are the angels, like, I don't want to say synonymous, like, like connected to each one, but are the, angels, are the angels able to help us keep the armor uh, via the priesthood or in via keeping the covenant. Uh, if I if I hear if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, the angels are here as messengers. Many times they were called watchers. They was also called messengers. And so we have said on many occasions that they are not to be worshipped. We've seen them taking uh, Abraham to a high place, or even in the ascension of Isaiah, he bowed down. They said, "Don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. I'm your fellow brethren." You worship Abba Yahweh and he alone. So we're not pushing worship these, even though they are billions of times more powerful than us. 
they pale in contrast to the true Abba, the true creator of all things, and they are messengers of him. And so if you are sick and you come into the heavenly father in the light of Eliashib, who's waiting there to hear your prayers, take it up to the most high. Repay your Allah, absolutely. So you become cognizant of it, and you'll begin to hear this more in the oblations that he is taking it to the heavenly father. We're just addressing that that messenger take it to the most high. And so the same thing as we go into the golden altar in the sanctuary, we're looking at Gabriel taking this, standing on behalf of us, giving up a trespass offering. We now see that Uriel is standing there stopping the accusations of the wicked. And so we address our forgiveness through that potential, I mean, that, that angel who's bringing forth that power. Again, I cannot stress that he is not, they are not to be worshipped. They are facilitators of the will of the Most High. Con, right. One more question. Con. So also in Revelations, um, in that same verse, Revelations um, 2 and 18, um, where it was talking about Jezebel and how um, she was seducing, seducing um, the servants to eat uh, eat uh, sacrifices of uh, abominable sac sacrifices or whatever, mm -hmm. and um, and also in um, in in uh, B Bell and the dragon uh, within there, it was talking about how on uh, Daniel uh, refused to eat and or drink. Ah. So it kind of reminds me of like while we're in the oblations, we 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 eat and we drink. Right, that's exactly right. So and you and, you, and then you said something about like. When it comes to uh, doing like anniversary, celebrating certain things that come around, it's not about it's not about the eating and drinking. It's about what you're eating and drinking toward, in, yep. in a sense. Like yep. if it's an abomin abominable thing. So it made me think about um um uh, Job uh, first chapter. I think it's Job one in four, and um it talks about how uh, his, his children every say every man their day is that. Is every every man their day? That does that is that equivalent to a birthday? Is that saying like you know? Because I know some people be like, you know, they say this is my day. You know what I'm saying? So when they're saying every man my day, it, I want to know is does that mean birthday? And because like they're after that they ate and they drunk, and then and then Joe just in case if they were eating and drinking to something that was an abominable, he wouldn't put in oblations that morning, early in the morning before they woke up. So I just wanted to know is, is that equivalent? Uh, absolutely not. All right. They separated themselves to go do a feast. Birthday is not in scripture. Once again, this is a translation. The, ter the term yalad, yum, or yum yalad, two different words. They conflate it together to say birthday. All right. And so yalad means bear, bringing forth children and all of that. They have many connotations to it and used in a variety of ways throughout scripture. And so, again, there are scriptures that they have placed and said birthday where it's not birthday. All right, once again, they are asserting themselves in the midst of it. All right, and they have these compound words that they try to bring together to make it a more a Western sense to it. But that's not the Hebraic essence of it. And so, as I said before, we was talking about birthdays, nothing wicked about a birthday or any anniversary whatsoever. It may be the day you closed on your house. It may be the day you graduated from college and you're the first person in your family to graduate from college. And you say every year, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get with my brothers, and we're going to give up an oblation to the Most High, and we go, we're just going to you know, celebrate, man. One of my achievements that I made. And if you have one of these knucklehead, knuckle-dragging morons, you wicked, Ock, you should have dropped out of kindergarten like I did. This is, this is the level that we're on right now. There's nothing wicked. This is when you know something is wicked. There is a statute that tell you not to do it. All of this peripheral association to try to prove a point is evil. That's not how you do it. You don't understand the law, the statutes, the commandments of Abba Yahweh. So go to Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers. Go to Exodus and show here where it is a wicked thing. We just went through Scripture and showed right there that when she was sacrificed, it became a custom. Birthday is a custom, right? And they did it yearly, and there was nobody saying, you wicked for coming yeah. over here doing that. So if they can, if they can come and, and remember the day that is somber, this woman would never get married. She gave herself to the, to the church, and she must constantly stay there and engage in righteousness and all that, which is good. 
But the Most High gave a mandate to women, all right, be fruitful and multiply, bear children. She is never able to accomplish that because her father did that, and they did it every year. How much more are you doing something righteous? Any anniversary, there's nothing wrong with it. As I said, I know somebody's going to take that and they're going to run with it and say that we said blow out candles and put on the pointed hats, you know, sing happy birthday song. We're saying don't do that. Don't do that. Do your own thing. There is no Hebrew way to do it, but we know they acknowledged it. And nobody need to tell you how to celebrate an anniversary with you and your wife. You know, go do what y'all like. But I would say start everything with what the most I require. Give an oblation to the Heavenly Father. Give a thanksgiving offering to him. I thank you for this revolution. Uh, 364 days right here, came up, made it to the most high. All right, we here. We here. Thank the most high. Now, after this oblation, hey, let's go out. Let's go whatever. Let's go do what we, we like to do. Whatever's fun. Let nobody beguile you or deceive you. They heavy. On social media talking about birthdays. Yeah. Can't do it. And once again, it's always an inference. Look at what John the Baptist did. Don't matter what he did. What if John the Baptist made a covenant with the Heavenly Father? Let's say Manasseh made a covenant with the Heavenly Father. He broke it, as Scripture say. What are you supposed to say? Look at what Manasseh did. He broke covenant with Abba Yahweh. I don't believe in covenants. That's how dumb it sounds. That's how evil it is. Just because they did something wicked with something don't mean that there's a prohibition against it. You turn around and do it different. With that mindset right there, I'm telling you, people are superstitious. They don't want to dive in and get the meat that the Most High is bringing forth. they rather let their superstition push them. And if you're so wise, why is it that the Jehovah Witness do the exact same thing? Maybe you got it from them. Maybe your reasoning come from them as opposed to the Heavenly Father. Again, there is nothing wrong with celebrating any anniversary that you have in righteousness. It could be anything that's not wicked. All right, obviously you don't want to celebrate a murder that, you know, you got away with. You know, OJ shouldn't be talking about, I, this is the day I got to quit it. Don't fit, don't acquit. That's wickedness. All right, we're talking about righteousness. All right, nothing wrong with it. All right, anybody else, any questions? Shalom, peace. Shalom, sis. Very informative, class. <laughs> All um, praise to Abba Yahweh. Uh, so, is Part Partius and Sheol, the first heaven, and the air where these demons, is it all the same thing? I'm glad you asked that, right? Uh, we have a class called the seventh heaven. I'm not sure if you watch it already. We clearly break out and bring out, I should say, the distinct difference between every heaven. Now, if you're looking at it from our standpoint, it's just seven of them. Not really numbered, but seven of them. From our standpoint, where we at would be number one. But I always say that the Heavenly Father should be not in the seventh heaven, but the first heaven, all right? just out of respect and honor. But the way they write it is that we are in the first heaven, counting from where we are. Now, this heaven right here is cut in two divisions. We have the physical part and we have the spiritual part. As I said in the class, there is a back access to it, right? There's the, me the mechanics of it is invisible. We read it earlier today that Belial became invisible. He went to that other side of this realm. So there's a visible side and an invisible side. And they're working on that back side every day, all day. All right. And they have the ability to transcend, to move over that gulf. The only way they can do it, though, it's unmitigated trespasses. They're in the court of the Most High accusing you. Remember, Gabriel is at the court dealing with those who are in the court, and the serpents are those outside the court hearing their accusations against you. He has to. It's built that way. And then, obviously, Uriel is sitting there. Uriala is saying, uh, please, he gave up a trespass offering. Forgive him. Can't have him today. The mechanism is working, and I'll be willing at the very end, we're going to try to put it all together so people can see it in motion. But yes, Sheol, the grave, perdition, Tartarus, it's all this realm right here. And you have to know which one is divided, right? They mention the world many times. It's this side, this physical side we're on. But when you begin to see Sheol, it's talking about that spiritual side. Why is it the grave? Only death lives over there. You don't want it entering into you. 
How do it enter into us? Again, we, the children of Adam, was forced down because of Adam breaking a covenant into the primal man's body. And anytime you see in the new covenant, them talking about the flesh, they're talking about the primal man. This primal body was made to be governed by watchers. And watchers would come down and ensure that they would not go awry. And anything, any kind of propensity to do wickedness, the watchers would ensure that it don't happen. All right, but now you have a mixed wheat and tares mixed together. That means that the primal man, the carnal ones that was made primal, have mixed with the children of Adam and Eve. So you just can't come down killing. You have to separate the wheat from the tares. Some of the children of Adam going to act like the primal men until they recognize that they're not primal. And they're going to put off that primal man, put off that flesh, and convert back to the immortal divine ones that they are. So, yes, sister, right here, there is, in this first heaven, the physical side and the spiritual side. Now, when you begin to go to the second heaven, you're only dealing with the spiritual now. But the Most High made this, this specific way. All right, good question. And that was the long of it. All right, anyone else? Any questions regarding this class or the previous two classes? Before we go online? All right. Yeah, you can read that on there. All right, we're going to go online. So if you're online, get your questions together. Go ahead and send it to us. And uh, I'll be willing, we'll have answers for you. So I think that this series is extremely powerful. You may have heard these names before, Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel. We're seeing them in Scripture. We're seeing how they work. They all work for us. But these evil spirits you may not have heard before, they all work against us. When you may say that it feels like a dark cloud is over me, it feels like I'm cursed, these demons are relentlessly pelting you. All right, they are literally against you, accusing you in the court of the Most High relentlessly, persecuting and prosecuting you, where you're not able to get the advantage. You know, you feel like, ah, oh, why can't I get a better position? Why can't I meet that right person? What? they all there. We read about Tobit, Tobias, and his wife-to-be, Sarah. You see that she couldn't find a right husband because Asmodeus. He was right there making sure she did never, ever, ever found a good man. All right, she made sure that that never happened. Or he made sure it never happened. He said she was mine. Some of these demons claim our sisters. You mine, and you'll never have happiness. And so they make sure that you say the thing that repulse a good man. You may be saying, what? what? Why? I never? Yeah, a couple of them came through. A couple of them came through. But Asmodeus had you wilding out at the mouth. That brother was like, uh, I think I got to go cut my front yard. I know it's winter. That grass got to be high. Let me get up out of here. Looking for an excuse to get up out of there. Yeah. But get rid of Osmodeus, and then you can have that beautiful domestic union that you're looking for. And he only ran because Raphael came with an offering. And we're going to talk about the depths of that later. Very, very powerful, powerful uh, set of scriptures, though. What you got, Prince? We got uh, the first question from Dexter Mitchum. Says Shalom Priesthood. Shalom. Shalom Prince. Said power delivered. Follow up question uh, posed. Is there a reason for the placement of archangels of the night watch, the water? Not sure what he's talking about. Um, just come back, uh, Brother Dexter. Let us know. Give us some more details of what you're talking about. Well, probably the night watch chart. What about it? Oh, why they're placed, the ones we got? The attributes of them are according to that lot, if that's what he's asking. If you look at the night watch chart, you'll begin to see the day watch. We are in charge of the day watch. I'm thinking that this is what he's talking about. I'm not sure. The saints here are in charge of the day watch. Just like we covered in the second book of Adam and Eve, the heavenly father adopted them where he, the sons of Seth, he said they became my children. And so they began to give sacrifices in the 12 lots of the day. Now, if what the brother is asking, if we, you know, uh, got it correctly, the angels handled the prayers of the night watch. We're the children of the day, as the scriptures say. 
simply means we're placed over the day watch. We have no responsibility for the night watch. It doesn't mean you can't come to the night watch, but if you come to the night watch, you're coming as a guest. All right, it's not your, Pethiah is not yours. Maazi is not yours. You can go there and give up one because you just got to get one. You know, whatever, sin is on you, a trespass is on you, they welcome you in. But one of the things we cannot do is get into the night watch and fail to cover the day watch because they are not over the day watch. We are. And so the Heavenly Father has brought the priesthood together to hold down the day watch, and you begin to see those of that righteous pantheon holding down the night watch, giving up oblations uh, throughout the night, just like what we went through with Penuel, Penuel. And Jacob was right there, didn't want to get out the lot. He was like, my lot is coming up. You're about to cause me to be late. And so they struggled in spirit. And Penuel tried to wake him up out the spirit. He was like, I'm not coming out of this cloud. I'm not doing it. Give me my blessing. And he gave him his blessing. And so he pronounced his name as the aura, the face of the Elohim. So, yes, they handled the night watch. We handled the day watch. All right, what's the next question? Next question is from Nicholas Henry. He said, I have an interesting question. Where are the seven arch demons right now in the heavenlies above the earth's sky? Uh, going back to what was asked earlier, there is Tartarus. It's not even like the clouds, the sun. It is literally here. It's like watching, again, I'll give that analogy, a web page. There is a back access to it that you can't see. It takes the web designer or the engineer to go put in the codes and get in the back. And that's what the priests do. They get in the back and they begin to see the operations. It's almost like putting malware. Them demons come in the backside with malware and do all kind of stuff to tr you know, trample over the website. So it is a spiritual side, the invisible side that you go through in your chamber of imagery. It said Belial entered into their heart. You can look at your mind, your chamber of imagery being the gateway in and out that world. They come to you through that mind your chamber of imagery out of tartarus into the world and the same thing with us we enter into it to wage war against them it's not a place that you want to go and 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 frolic around that's their domain for the moment and the heavenly father promised that they're going to be eradicated out of there too and we're going to take full charge of this whole realm there will be no more perdition no more sheol no more grave no more death as the scriptures say i hope that answered the brother's question Go ahead. We have a question from Sister uh, Monica Williams. Says Shalom Priest. Shalom says, Thanks yet again for another informative class. For oh, clarification, are demons and angels the same? Always thought demons were spirits of the Nephilim, as stated in Enoch. Right. Those are not, those are evil spirits. Right? And these are the incalculable multitudes that you read about in Enoch. But that pantheon are the falling watchers from the sixth day. They are over all of those demons. They're over. So when we read in Jubilee that Mestima came and said, don't get rid of all of the spirits of sin. Leave a few so that I may reign over them, began to condemn men. So the evil spirits came through the sons of Seth, descending the mountain and procreating with the children of Cain. And they began to proliferate, and bring forth evil spirits after the flood. Once again, the Bible is complicated. The history is even more complicated. You have two falls. You got the one on the sixth day of creation, and you got one in the first millennium. And even scholars conflate them, bring them together, and can't tell the difference. But if you separate them and you look at this pantheon that we're talking about, we're talking about those who fell in the sixth day of creation. And these evil spirits came through, meaning spirits of sin that can easily be exterminated, or you can let rain within you, came from the fallen watchers, the sons of Seth that reigned in that first millennium and was brought back after the flood through incantations and the reading of the walls of the pyramids and Egyptology and through trespassing and transgressions. All right, so we are getting rid of their strength. What is the strength of Mestima? The incalculable multitudes of sin that he began to control. All right, so we're not able at this moment to get rid of Mestima, or Asmodeus, or Belial, we get rid of their legions, and we make sure that they have no fighters anymore. The Most High said at the end of 7,000 years, he's going to get rid of all of them. So what do we do at the Day of Atonement? Anybody know where we send those evil spirits back? 
Azazel, he was one of the ones that fell from that holy mountain. And so we're able to burn some and send the rest in captivity until the last and final day. So there's a difference between those leaders, those evil spirits called Satan, called Tanin, the dragon, and then the evil spirits of sin. All right, those evil spirits of sin come from, were generated from the watchers that went down from the holy mountain. And once again, those that pantheon reigns over them, make sure that they always whipping up some sin in the earth. All right, I hope that answered the question. Uh, we have a question from Sister Makisha Harrison. Says, Shalom, Chief Priest. Shalom says, beautiful class. All praises to our Abba. All praises, definitely. Looking at the calendrical study guide, it says, Holy Angel Uriel is over the 20th hour in the night watch pertaining to the golden altar. Is he the same angel mentioned in Revelations 8, 3, and 9, 13? Uh, we can get it real quick. Revelations 8 and 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden center. And it was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints, of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Con, absolutely. This is dealing with Gabriel doing what the Most High told him to do, is preside over all the prayers of the saints who come into paradise, the third heaven, sanctuary, and offer up their prayers to the Most High. And we in the Seventh Covenant know what happens in the Holy Sanctuary. This is where the tree of life is. And we've been given access again to the tree of life that Adam was forbidden to come into. He could not find his way into the holy sanctuary of the heavenly father. In the spiritual realm, to take from the three-pronged fruit, and you take that fruit, the leaves, the petals, the oil, and all of that, and you use it in spiritual places, manna, to offer up spiritual sacrifices to the creator. Good eye, sis. Absolutely correct. We have a question from uh, Nicholas Henry, Shalom Priest. Shalom. In the Gog and Magog war between righteous and wicked, are we going to fight the demonic spirits, especially seven arc demons? Uh, we went through Gog and Magog. Go check out those classes. We spoke, spoke about it with great specificity. When it comes to that, these evil spirits, Belial, like entering into the king, like it entered into Ahab, we are fighting against their confederacy they're now going to take over a massive amount millions of people it says that they are going to seduce all men to come and fight against the saints and so we're going to have all kingdoms unified by these evil spirits running their kingdom against the saints so it's going to be a physical and a spiritual battle simultaneously happening there all right but the beautiful thing is that's not a battle for us to fight they tell you that the Messiah is going to come with incalculable angels in the spiritual and physical realm to handle the vengeance of the Most High upon them. And those who become watchers will be a part of that. They will be a part of that. And the 144,000 are 144,000 watchers. They watch over all of creation every hour of the day, of the week, of the month, and the year. 144,000. Every day, 12,000 in the night, 12,000 in the day watch. 144,000 day watch saints watching over all of creation is what the Heavenly Father is reinstituting on the earth. And I specifically say reintroducing because David set up the exact same thing. He had 144,000 priests holding down the watches until the destruction of the temple. And we find it in the New Testament, New Covenant. We find Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, in the lot of Abiah, offering up oblations, trying to keep that covenant going. And so that's going to be reinstilled. That is the 144,000 watchers. And a lot of people say they want to be amongst that number. But if you don't know about the seventh covenant, you don't know about oblations, you don't know about the covenant of David, you don't know about fighting sin, I guarantee you you're not one of those 144,000. All right? Next question. We have another question from Sister Makisha Harrison. It's part two of the question. Did you say that the Holy Archangel, the Holy Angel Penuel is also Holy Archangel Uriel? And if so, that means he is also over the 15th lot of consecration. And when Jacob's name was changed to Israel, was he actually 
being consecrated as a priest, not just only a name change. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He was consecrated into a new covenant. Given that name is, uh, well, not say a new covenant, uh, new parameters to that covenant. And so we're going to talk about the lots in the final class when we start putting it all together, showing where everybody, where everybody resides in this whole machinery called this world, the first heaven. We're going to specifically bring out all of the angels' uh, mission and the mission of these evil forces as well. All right, but yeah, when uh, his name was changed, it was a consecration on that name, giving him authority to actually live in a priest of the Most High. All right, uh, I believe this to be a second part of Sister Monica Williams' question. Also, are fallen angels the so-called gods over the nations? Did the creation of Tanin, the ancient dragon, and the head of the evil pantheon predate the creation of the Godhead? I'll read that one again. Are the are the are fallen angels the so-called gods over the of other nations? And did the creation of Tanin, the ancient dragon, and the head of the evil pantheon predate the creation of the Godhead? Yeah, we covered that. Absolutely. Um, that Tanin came out, it was Badal Tanin. It means ancient. And so that was part of the deception, is that he was old. He predates that creation. And when Adam was part of the creation, jealousy set in. And so, yes, he predates that creation. And the idol set forth, yes, it is these evil spirits, but it's not. They're putting it there for your destruction. And yes, they gloat in, I'm Belial, you're going to worship Baal. But as we see in the class today, there was no life in it. They don't dwell in clay. They don't dwell in metal. They dwell in you. All right, and so they just put their name on it. It's not a true deity whatsoever. They dwell in you. So you may see the name on these idols, but that's not a true depiction of their deity that they're putting forth. All right, these demonic forces know exactly what they're doing. They know that in your covenant, it is written, it is high treason, high spiritual treason against the Heavenly Father to engage in any polytheistic religion, the multiple God worship, the Heavenly Father, that will quickly turn the Heavenly Father against you. And so they do it just for that and that alone, so that you can be rejected of the Heavenly Father. All right, that's it. Last question from Sister Makisha Harrison. She said, Ezekiel 16, 47 through 50 talks about the seven sins of Sodom. Are these abominations directly tied to the seven arc demons? Time. We covered that as well. Uh, we didn't cover it in this class, but once again, held for the seventh class. We talk about the seven sins that the Heavenly Father hate. He speaks about all of these attributes of, that pan, uh, attributes of those evil demons. It's the same thing here when we cover the seven sins of Sodom. It is letting you know what was prevailing in Sodom. So when you read about lack of empathy, wealth, and wantonness and all of that, it's going right back to these evil spirits that dwelt in Babel, dwelling in Sodom. Absolutely. Good. All right. We're going to close on that, but once again, be aware, this is the Feast of Weeks. And being that it is the Feast of Weeks, this so-called Christmas is a sort of an abomination of desolation. What is an abomination of desolation? When they put a pagan day on our high holy days. And since these holy days are a stretch of 50 and it's caught up in the mist, it is a provocative day, abomination that would make us desolate. Let us not forget, again, to bring forth your tights. Visit the website, Shekinaya.com, and on it, you can begin to get some of this handcrafted oblation wine. This wine is not for popping on Saturnalia with your uncle and Uncle Troy and Leroy getting faded, getting nice under the Yuletide log. It's not for that. This is for oblations and oblations alone. You only need a small amount. A little will do, as they say. And this right here is the uh, bread that we use. This is the flour for the bread to make. The new formulation is absolutely delicious. And we're not eating it for the, you know, the delicacy of it. We're eating it, you know, obviously as the bread, the body, the meat offerings of our sacrifice. So this is the drink offering. 
This is the meat offering. Get your double onyx as well so that you can maintain your health in these last days. Also, we have the, um, the living waters, right? the colloidal blends. Gold, copper, and silver, the temple blend. It is for keeping your cognitive ability high so that the gold is going through on that micro level. And electro electricity and electrolysis is going all through your body. And everybody knows that copper and silver and gold is the best conductors of electricity. Taking that with your prayers and oblations does everything on the physical you need to do to get your consciousness right to give up the oblations unto the Most High. I salute you all. May the Most High bless us all. Stand firm in these days of provocation against the saints. Let us stand in the oblations. May the peace and thanksgiving offerings of the Most High be multiplied. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.